so good morning, everyone. I think it's time that we start. Thank you very much for joining this section to this early morning. Maybe we start and people will join in the meantime. So uh, I know that this is quite early for some of you that are in different countries, but I think this time was chosen to balance between different countries so everyone could attend. And I think we will have uh, some inter very interesting presentation and we're covering this very quite exciting topic, multi-messenger and multi wavelength observations of AGNs. Uh, we are going to start with Matteo Kerudin, I was going to present uh, photons and neutrinos from AGNs and review presentation. Matteo, you will have 20 minutes and five minutes for the questions. So I will notify you when you have two minutes left. So this way you okay. can organize your presentation. So please start. So whenever I have a question in the end, we could ask Matteo, please start. Okay. Thank you very much. You can see the screen fine, right? Yes, full okay. screen, very good. Okay, uh, hi everybody and uh, hi Narek and thank you very much for, for giving me this uh, this opportunity to give you uh, yeah what I prepared as a bit of a, a review for uh, for in general hadronic radiative models in, in blazers. Um, so I, I I mean the goal I had is uh, to make this a kind of an introduction for all the talks that uh, will happen later in the session so it will, I, hopefully it will be useful. Uh, for people who are not that familiar with hadronic models, but also for the, for the next speaker to have some kind of introduction so they can go in, in more details into, into the, the work they, they've done. Um, so let me first in, introduce very briefly the, the, the sources we are, we are uh, working on. So um, you know that we are uh, talking about active galactic nuclei. Uh, in, in some um, around 10% of cases, uh, the accretion uh, that we see on, on the supermassive black hole is associated with this uh, outflow of plasma that is launched along the polar axis of the, of the black hole. Uh, and whenever you see this jet um, uh, down its axis, so whenever we, the observer is located into this, in, in this position, um, the emission is from the jet is uh, boosted uh, by relativistic effects. And uh, what we see is from an observational point of view, what we call a blazer. So a blazer is uh, this radio loud AGN pointing towards us. And uh, from an observational characteristic, that what happens is that we are um, basically blinded by the emission from the jet, by this known thermal emission that uh, makes it actually very difficult to see what's going on in the vicinity of the black hole. So for example, uh, it's basically impossible to see uh, the X-ray corona that we see in Cipher galaxies, um, the big blue bump we see only in some cases, so the accretion disk we see only some uh, in the brightest quasars, um, and uh, the, the same is true for the torus and the proton orbiter. From an observational perspective, uh, after uh, decades of observation, we understand now that there are two subclasses of blazers. It's not an homogeneous, uh, an homogeneous class. Um, the names are historical. Uh, we use the FSRQ class, flat spectrum radio quasar, uh, to identify sources in which, uh, in addition to the jet, we also see the thermal component. So we see the big blue bump and we see the broad line region in forms of, of lines. Uh, why we call BL the objects, sources in which the optically UV spectrum is, is a featureless continuum, so we don't see any uh, anything else besides the non-thermal emission from, from the jet. Uh, these two classes are, of course, um, it are not a surprise, and uh, I'm actually finding them contributed to, to our um, unified model of AGN because uh, for the parent objects, the sources that we see edge on, so the radio galaxies, we also see two kinds of radio galaxies, FR1 and FR2. So we think that what we are seeing is indeed uh, uh, FR1 sources as BLR and FR2 sources as FSRQ. So when you see, uh, when you look at the uh, spectral energy distribution of blazers from the radio up to the TV, as I, as I told you, um, it, it is dominated by this non-thermal continuum. Uh, it has a form of, uh, of this double um, humped structure. So we clearly have two distinct emission components um, covering the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so if you want, the, the, the shape of the SED is also, can also be seen as a, as a distinct uh, feature of blazers. And we can also identify blazers uh, uh, using SED. Um, when you look at these two blazers, uh, blazers uh, classes that I talked to you before, the FSRQ are uh, always this kind of low energy peak here in the infrared. Uh, I mean, it's not always, it's, you, you always have exceptions in astrophysics, but in the large majority of cases, you have these uh, low frequency peak uh, sources. On the other end, uh, when you look at the BLX, um, the, the peak move around. So you can have a low frequency peak BLX, uh, which are basically FSRQ-like. 
but you can also have high frequency peak be a luck with the peak that can go as high as the x-ray. So this uh, is a famous plot by Fossati et al, 1998. It shows the, the so-called blazer sequence that we are not discussing today. Um, but nowadays we know that there is another class here that what we call the extreme be a luck in which the peak is, is, is at the um, x-ray energies or beyond. Yes. So, um, of course, once we detect these sources, we are interested to understand how uh, can we uh, produce photons uh, across all the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so the low energy SCD component, this one that we have at the low energies, um, it is, uh, there is consensus in the literature that what we are observing are electrons or positrons in the jet in a magnetized environment that are radiating via uh, synchrotron and synchrotron radiation. Uh, the big question is, uh, how do we produce the second component and how do we make the gamma rays out of, out of the jet? So in leptonic models, uh, the, mm, the, the physical process at the, at the, at the uh, microphysics level is inverse Compton scattering. So what we are observing are um, lepton uh, scattering of photons and then uh, producing high energy, uh, high energy photons. Um, you can then have a variety of, of uh, if you want subclasses of, of, uh, of models. So uh, you have the synchrotron self Compton in which the same leptons scatter the same uh, synchrotron radiation. So it's, uh, you, you basic, basically have your, your first uh, synchrotron radiation and then you, you upscatter it to, uh, to higher energies. Or you can uh, scatter external photon fields uh, that are abundant in this, uh, in this environment. Um, as a very simple rule, uh, SSC models works for high frequency peak via luck. While if you go to, if you want to model FSRQ or LBL, you need to take into account external fields that we see. So it's not a surprise in FSRQ, we, we see the big dugamp, we see uh, the BLR. So we need to include these fields uh, when we want to fit, uh, we want to fit SCD. Um, so the big question is then, okay, if this, uh, if you believe what I, I told you here, so that we, we can have electronic modeling, uh, why do we bother to add hadrons in the, uh, in the model if the electronic one work. So the first one is of course, um, as we will see later, and as we have seen in these recent years, um, uh, adronic model um, offer a natural link with uh, neutrino astronomy and, and cosmic rays. Uh, AGN have been uh, highlighted as possible sources of cosmic rays since, uh, since forever, basically. So uh, it, it would be a very, a very major result to try to identify or try to see uh, adron acceleration in, in AGN jets. And the other question is that uh, what I told you here is not actually true. Uh, so of course, in general, this works, but there are always exceptions. So we have seen cases in which leptonic models are uh, actually face a lot of difficulties in, in, in fitting the, the blazer SEDs, and in particular, orphan flares. So flares, variability that you see in, in gamma rays, for example, without associated emission or without associated flare, um, variability in the lower energy bands are very difficult to explain in, in leptonic models. And the reason is uh, simply the fact that in leptonic models, the two SED bumps are tightly connected. So if one vary, the other has to vary. It's very difficult to have a, a Compton, inverse Compton only flare without having any change in the synchrotron bump. So the, this is why I think from the 90s uh, already, uh, people started to think how to, uh, can we get uh, a satisfactory hadronic model to the, to the SED? So the simplest hadronic model is, is, uh, is very simple. Uh, what we do is that we add uh, a proton population in this, in this jet. And uh, the easiest way to produce gamma ray is to let the, this uh, proton radiate via synchrotron radiation. So the, uh, this is a paper by uh, Mushkin and Protero in 2001. So you have this, this your blazer SED. This was Markarian 4 to 1. Uh, you have synchrotron emission by electrons here and then synchrotron emission by protons here. Uh, of course, the, the parameter space you are working in are very difficult uh, you, to, to get a, a satisfactory uh, flux and energies out of protons via synchrotron radiation. You need to have a much, much higher magnetic field compared to what you have in leptonic models. So in leptonic models, usually we are um, below the goals. Okay, we can have uh, even the milli goals in some cases. Uh, in a proton synchrotron solution, we need to go to tens of gauss if we want to have this kind of solution. But you can see that uh, I will show you later that uh, it works. I mean, we can reproduce the, the peak frequency and the flux level uh, in a satisfactory way. Um, of course, it, uh, it, it is not that easy. And the main reason is that um, we cannot just have proton synchrotron radiation. Proton synchrotron radiation is the first, uh, is the first process, but then whenever you add protons in, this, uh, in the jet, uh, well, they start interacting. 
Um, the main way they interact in, uh, uh, in this environment is via proton-photon interaction. Uh, so you have a, a high relativistic proton scattering uh, a low energy gamma, and you have two main channels that you need to take into account. The first one is photomeson production, and the, and the uh, other one is the direct pile production via beta alpha process. So in the photomeson production, uh, I, I, I wrote it like that, but uh, I hope you can uh, you can understand what I mean by this uh, by this formulation here. So uh, sometimes you produce a pi zero, and then sometimes you go to the to the uh, charged pions. Uh, you of course have resonances here with the delta uh, uh, mesons, etc. Uh, so uh, then you have your branching factor. You you, you calculate it, and so at the end uh, you add uh, uh, a production of uh, direct gamma production so via a pion zero decay. Or via the decay of charged pions, uh, you get muons that then decay into uh, electrons and positrons. And this decay, uh, this electroweak decay, is associated with the neutrino emission. So uh, the proton the, is, is this channel is the photomeson production uh, that it is inherently multi messenger. So whenever we have uh, high relativistic protons, we get photons out of it, but neutrinos out of it, which is the most interesting thing. Um, the beta ether per production is very interesting. Uh, it is very important, as I will show you later. Um, it is not a neutrino channel. So uh, whenever you have uh, th these two processes are actually in competition uh, between each other. So you have uh, the proton that has a given uh, cross section to, to, to scatter to, to do photomeson or to do uh, beta ether. It depends on the energy, of course. Beta ether, of course, at the, a bit at the lower energies. Uh, so you can produce um, pairs, and then uh, you lose energy of your protons. Um, so the, from a numerical point of view, this is uh, a rather complex task. We, you need to compute all the secondaries that are injected into the emission models. And then usually these secondaries are extremely energetic. Um, and so this trigger um, synchrotron supported pair cascades. So basically you have uh, this um, or this, if you want, directly this, these gammas um, are extremely energetic. Uh, so it can be the TV or the PV band. And so they pair produce immediately. Uh, they pair produce uh, electron uh, positrons that then radiate synchrotron emission and then per produce and radiate and per produce, etc. Another important thing is the synchrotron emission by muons. Um, here, you can see that in some part of the parameter space, uh, these uh, muons have a, a lifetime that is uh, large enough that they can radiate photons via synchrotron radiation before decaying uh, into electrons and positrons. And so in some cases, this can also be something to, to take into account. So now I show you a bit of a more recent uh, version of what I showed you before. So this is 10 years later. Um, I think it's, it always amazes me that in, in 10 years only, how much we improve the data, but also how much we improve the models. And so uh, this was the first paper by the Fermilat collaboration on Marcaria 41. It's re really the same source as this one. And uh, you can see that uh, we are, uh, OK, this was already 10 years ago, but we are in a, in a, in a uh, place in which we can um, adjust the SED uh, in, and I'll show you how does it compare between a leptonic and a dronic scenario. Um, so you can see that the dronic scenario, the dronic emission model um, does a fairly good job. Of course, here you, you are supposed to have an extra uh, component at low energy, but it's not, uh, it's not difficult to add. Uh, but you can see that the high energies, uh, the, the two fits are basically, are basically good enough. Um, here, let me highlight you uh, what are we looking at. So when you look at dronic models, you have actually a lot of separate components that contribute to the total emission. Uh, here in red, we have the proton synchrotron radiation. In blue, for this particular scenario, is dominated by mu synchrotron radiation. It's uh, very, very, um, very relevant, it's actually dominating the, the CD. And then you have these uh, pion cascades. So these are the electron-positron pairs that are radiating synchrotron radiation that uh, emerge here and here. And this, I think in this model, there was no beta ether computed, but I will show you later what it is. Um, so um, here, uh, so why is beta ether important? Uh, so here I show you a paper by um, Petropoulos and Mastichiadis of 2015, um, in which I can show you, uh, I mean, they show you um, that beta ether process can be extremely relevant for, uh, for blazer physics and adronic models because they inject pairs at a lower energy compared to photomeson. And uh, so you fill in your gap between the, the, the two SED bumps. So here it doesn't matter, um, okay, they, they were not fitting uh, SEDs. So uh, it, the only thing relevant here is, is the energy, but you see that here you have uh, your pairs uh, by, um, by pion decay. 
and the beta iter fill this part here, fill this valley here. So in your SEDs, you will see this as a um, as a third bump occurring in 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 between the, the two bumps. And the other thing, but I already said, is that um, taking into account the what happens to the uh, intermediate leptons is also very important. So we need to follow what's going on in in muons if we want to compute correctly the flux. Uh, of the neutrinos or of the of the one to compare correctly the uh, five cascades. Um, there are other hadronic models uh, that uh, use proton-proton interactions. Uh, I will show you only a few examples here. Proton-proton um, interaction is basically very similar to what you have in the photomeson interaction. So you have in the uh, proton-photon interaction. So you have high energy proton uh, hitting not a low energy photons, but hitting on a target. So on a, on a, on a cold proton uh, that acts as a target and then serve as, as a target for, for, for pion production. So you have exactly the same processes. You have different threshold, of course, because you don't have to um, um, take into account the change of reference frame when you have the energy of your, of your, um, of your protons into the energy of the, of the high energy one. Um, it is very well known in astrophysics because uh, it is widely used for galactic sources. So it is a very important process, for example, in supernova remnants uh, to explain the gamma ray emission and the neutrino emission. Uh, when you look at uh, blazers, um, usually it is not that relevant process. So if you consider, for example, this case, in which you have a single zone producing your uh, your gamma rays via uh, photomeson production, you can compute the PP interaction, but it turns out to be very low. Uh, and the reason is that uh, these particular uh, parameters that we are using here are uh, imply a, a, a rather uh, large and non-dense emitting region in which the PP uh, cross section is very low. Then it can become important and should be taken into account whenever your emitting region becomes very dense and uh, you can have these kind of scenarios. And in particular, it is a very important uh, scenario whenever you have jet obstacle inter interactions. So when you have uh, your jet hitting on some target that can be a star, can be the, uh, a broader region cloud, uh, etc. So um, let me show some example of of, uh, of adronic modeling SED and what is the current status of the art, more or less. So you can have um, modeling of FSRQ. Uh, here we have this very famous paper by by Marcus Butcher and collaborators in 2013, in which uh, they uh, fit SEDs of blazers of Fermilab blazers um, and FSRQ in particular. Um, both in a leptonic and ergonic scenario. So again, they show that it works. This is the same source fitted with, um, uh, in this case, a external inverse component. In this case, is a proton synchrotron uh, scenario. Um, so it works. Uh, it faces an important problem that has been highlighted by several authors. Uh, and I think now there is a general consensus that it is problematic. And the reason is that you can get a, a good fit, but you need a power of the jet, uh, which is often super Eddington. And by super Eddington, I mean by several orders of magnitude in some cases. So of course, this uh, Eddington luminosity just gives us an idea of more or less where, where how much is the, 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 the power that we have available for, the, for our AGN. Uh, in a lot of cases, we don't really know what is the black hole mass. But so, I mean, if we have with a factor of a few to the, um, Eddington, Eddington luminosity is not a big deal, but when we start getting luminosity of 10 to the 49, 10 to the 50, it can become a very important problem. So this is a general problem of, of, um, of um, hadronic models in the sense that uh, often they do a good job in describing the SED, but the energetic is, is problematic. So I think this is a, always a suggestion for everybody who is uh, looking for the first time at hadronic models is always check the energetics you are dealing with. Um, before saying that the model is good or not, because it can be uh, it can be so high that it's be become uh, implausible. So of course this is important whenever you have bright quasar um, like FSRQ. Um, in this work in 2015, we concentrated on the other edge of the blazer sequence, if you want. So when you look at very um, non non um, yeah well non FSRQ like objects or so extreme HBLs or very dim and with very little variability, uh, we found that hadronic modeling is, is, uh, does actually a very good job uh, compared, to, um, compared to leptonic ones that in this case uh, face a bit of, uh, of um, difficulties to, to fit the SD. So uh, as you know, things change uh, very much uh, since the, uh, with the detection of, or the evidence of emission by, uh, of joint gamma and neutrino from Texas of 506. So it is the first time we can actually test um, emission models and uh, not just 
uh, on using photos, but also using this, uh, this neutrino event. Uh, if you notice until now, I didn't show you any, any neutrino spectrum. And the reason is that uh, well, before this event, there was, uh, okay, there was nothing we can really compare to. Uh, so I will go quickly and show you a bit what we, um, what we learned from this event uh, uh, in terms of modeling and what is uh, the current status of the... Uh, of Matteo, you, you have two minutes left. Okay, I will, I, 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 will, I, will, I will cut it short. Yes, mm. yes, yes. So we'll finish with this 2017 flare, showing you a bit uh, what happened and, uh, and what kind of models to put forward to explain this, uh, this, um, uh, this event. Um, so the first thing that uh, people did was try to fit uh, the uh, SCD in a proton synchrotron, um, proton -synchrotron uh, scenario. And uh, in general, the agreement was that uh, we can have proton synchrotron solutions. So uh, I mean, in terms of the SED, so you can actually feed the SED with a proton synchrotron. It's not a surprise, we already knew that this happened, but the expected neutrino rate is, uh, is very low. So usually, uh, I mean, not usually, it, we can consider that at least for this event, uh, this model is disfavored. What people put forward are uh, so-called leptotronic solutions that we, I, I never really show you until now. So of course, uh, it can, very well be that we don't have a pure leptonic model or a pure hadronic model, but we have something mixed. Uh, we have a hybrid model in which uh, we have um, an SSC dominated uh, component here. So in which you have MEV to GV band, which is dominated by SSC, and then you have hadronic cascades. So you have your uh, proton population and here you have uh, beta ether emission. Here you have photo meson uh, pairs and here you have the neutrinos associated with it. Here I show you another paper by uh, Gao et al. Uh, the, the parameters are a bit different. You can have, uh, but it is the same. So you have beta iter, photo meson, and then the neutrinos here. Uh, these are single zone uh, models. And again, uh, they face the problem that they are very energetic. So in our cases, we were up to uh, 10 to the 48 Earth per second, in their case, up to 10 to the 50. Um, this can be easily solved uh, if you consider that the photons that you do uh, scattering on for the proton gamma interactions are not internal to the source, like in this case. So in this case, the, the, the target are the synchrotron photons by the electrons, but they are external. It's, it's very simple to understand. You just uh, increase the probability to have a P gamma interaction so you can lower your proton power. You need less protons to get the same uh, photon output. And so several orders, um, um, basically at the same time, okay? There are just a few months between each other. Uh, proposed uh, different solutions. So in which you have P gamma scattering on external fields. And in this case, you can get a neutrino rate, which is of the order of 0. something, which is consistent with the neutrino event that was detected by ASCUB with luminosity, which are much lower uh, of the order of 10 to the 45. Then of course the question becomes, what is the external field? Uh, in this case, what is generic black body? Uh, in this case, they were working on um, uh, radiative inefficient accretion flow, or we can have a structured jet in which you do scattering on uh, layers of um, from the external field. I finish with this one, Anorak. Sorry, I just go a bit a bit long. Sure, sure, um, no problem. And um, as as I promised you before, um, we have a very interesting alternative to this uh, uh, to this model, and these are the jet cloud interactions. So uh, these are models which are in which you have uh, your jet hitting on a target, and this can um, can produce emission here at this level. So I will just uh, flash you a bit of, of the result. Uh, there was this paper by, by uh, Sakyan, uh, there was the paper by, by Liu, but also by, by Wang. Uh, and again, in these cases, you can have um, neutrino rates which are basically consistent with, uh, with what we have found here. Um, okay, let me finish with this slide. Um, so what did we learn on hadronic models? So the first thing we learned is that um, at least from this uh, event, if this is, uh, this is uh, representative of the general uh, um, uh, emission scenarios we have, pure hadronic solutions are excluded. And what we have as a favorable scenario now is a leptonic electromagnetic emission with a subdominant hadronic component uh, that can uh, much, uh, let's say, work in a much more efficient way if we uh, take care of, of external fields as photon target uh, as well. So I think I uh, finish here. I had uh, also the slides on the 2014 event, uh, but I think I can skip it and uh, I take your questions. Thank you very much, Matteo, for this very detailed and comprehensive review of the hadronic processes. Indeed, these, are, these models are becoming very attractive now, yes? So we have a time for the questions. Please, whoever question can ask directly or write in the chat.
well, until they, they, they ask, I have my self question uh, about the energetics. Yes, uh, these hydraulic models always require uh, energetics that should be super addinct on. Yes, um, I think on Monday there was a presentation by the Narayan in this one of the uh, sessions in this Marcel Grossman meeting, and he was showing this graph uh, of different regimes that are formed so this is this and he was showing that there could be this uh, super eddington region formed and could be two three orders of magnitude larger than the eddington luminosity uh, in your opinion if you take this into account the simulations and this limit given by this theoretical exp expectation could we fit this powerful blazers within hadronic models okay. or still still are not enough i mean this okay theory? Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, I have to admit I, 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 didn't, I didn't see this presentation. I will have a look at it. But I think that in general, from, from, from our point of view, so from when you want to try to fit the SED, um, as I said, uh, we use this as a general um, ballpark reference. So we, we uh, if you want, it, you can go, of course, to Bradington. There is nothing in the, in the model that, that prevents you, um, besides the fact that at some point you need to take into account, I mean, you need to discuss how much realistic are the parameters you fit. So this is true for everything, of course. It's true for the, for the uh, total luminosity of the meteor region. It's true for the magnetic field you get. It's true for the index of the particle, etc. So in general, I think that I would say if, whenever you fit BLX, uh, this is not uh, that problematic. I think in this case, um, whenever you are, I don't know, between 46, 47, 48, it's, it's, it's all right. I think when you start to go to the 10 to the 50, and in the literature, you find easily models that have 10 to the 50 or more. I think I, was, I saw some one 10 to the 52, something like this. This, I, it, in my opinion, it starts becoming too bright. And then, of course, mm -hmm. you need to also to consider how long is this super Eddington phase. I think it's, it might not be a problem, um, although I'm not an expert on accretion. Uh, if you have um, rapid flares or, or, or rapid uh, period in which you have a super Eddington uh, uh, events. Uh, but then, of course, if you want to look at the study. So right now, have, as you have seen, I'm only discussing SCDs. Okay, so you can have uh, flares fit. But if you want to have like a steady state or low state in which you have uh, then basically years of, of, of uh, accretion and ejection into, into your jet, um, constantly super Eddington, then maybe there is something we are not understanding either on the accretion or the model is wrong. I think we, that, that's also the other conclusion we should get. Yes, so thank you very much, Matteo. There are other questions? Does not seem the case. Thank you very much, Matteo, once you. more for this nice presentation. So now we move to the second speaker. So the second speaker is Sarkis Gasperian that is going to present the pre-adronic modeling of the emission process in blazer jets. So this is kind of continuation of the presentation of Matteo. So Sarkis, please share your screen. Yes, we see your screen already. Okay, could you hear me well? Yes, yes, we can hear very well. So you have a 15 minutes. I will notify you when you have two minutes left, okay? Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you, Mato, for a very interesting introductory uh, presentation. So I'm Sarkis from Ukraine, Armenia. I will uh, present a work on simulation of leptohadronic processes in very high energy sources uh, in collaboration with Damien Begui and Narek Sahakyan. Uh, the non-thermal emission processes uh, in relativistic astronomical environments such as GRBs, tidal disruption events, or AGNs is one of the main open questions in high energy astrophysics. Uh, before the first uh, very high energy neutrino detection, uh, the main messenger for uh, studying the particle acceleration and emission processes in those objects were photons observed from radio to gamma rays which were not sufficient to uh, estimate, for example, the proton content in those objects. And in 2019, uh, 2017, when the first very high energy neutrino detected by ice tube and then further uh, was associated with the specific laser, uh, it opened a new window to study, uh, to study cosmic ray acceleration emission processes uh, in those environments. And the further uh, is discoveries of uh, neutrino candidate sources made uh, 
some demand for leptohadronic uh, simulators, and I will present a new one here. So throughout the presentation, I will discuss the basic characteristic of laser emission, uh, as well as the main processes, uh, emission processes between leptonic and hadronic frameworks with their kinematics. Uh, will uh, demonstrate a new time-dependent leptohadronic uh, code with, um, with its physical applications. Uh, first, I will start from blazers. Blazers are uh, extreme subclass of AGNs whose jets towards to the observer. They classify as very luminous and uh, uh, variable sources. Their uh, non-thermal emission ranges from radio to gamma rays, uh, has two distinctive uh, components on SED. At the low, low component is believed to be produced from synchrotron uh, radiation of uh, relativistic electrons while for the high energy component, we have two main scenarios, the, uh, the leptonic origin, uh, which implies uh, that it is produced from inverse Compton scattering of soft photons on uh, relativistic electrons, or hadronic origin where it's high energy proton contribution dominates. Let's take a quick journey through the main processes of leptonic and hadronic uh, interactions. Uh, in hadronic processes, uh, protons undergo uh, uh, synchrotron radiation or photohadronic interaction through which uh, either uh, it can create uh, electron positron pairs directly or uh, simulate a cascade and create new uh, hadrons and uh, leptons. Uh, then uh, through the decay or emission, these leptons can uh, radiate either synchrotron, inverse Compton, pair production or annihilation processes and uh, form this uh, uh, broadband SED. Here the kinetic equations are depicted uh, describing those uh, above mentioned uh, interactions uh, to track the temporal evolution uh, for uh, particle distribution functions. One needs to solve the system of these equations in a such consistent manner uh, to, uh, with the goal to model multivariant and multi-messenger data sets, we developed the full-time dependent leptohadronic uh, code, uh, uh, which uh, solves uh, those system of equations. The code Soprano st stands for uh, stands for simulator of processes in relativistic astronomical objects. Uh, it's a Python and C-based full-time dependent numerical code. Uh, it says a Python interface, very easy to use. Uh, most heavy traces are executed through the C part of the code. Uh, it has a modular structure, meaning the new processes can be added as well as removed. And the uh, uh, way uh, equations are treated, ensures the energy conservation always and particle number when required. Behind the numerical discretization, we put two assumptions. First, that space is homogeneous and particle distribution functions are isotropic. In energy discretization, we use this continuous galaxy first order method, which conserves uh, ensures conservation of particle number when required, and we enforce energy to conserve by balancing cooling and particle creation. Uh, the, the large discrepancy between uh, uh, time scales for different processes require uh, implicit temporal discretization, which is applied for Soprano. We have tested Soprano in many ways. I will demonstrate a few tests here. You can see on the plot, proton mean three path as a function of Lorentz factor for the photomeson process on the left and uh, photopion process for on the right part compared to semi analytic solutions available in the literature. And the good comparison agreement uh, uh, states that Soprano does a good job. On the bottom, you see the comparison between uh, Soprano and uh, widely used Jagan Cooper scheme for synchrotron and inverse Compton time dependent uh, spectra. And uh, also, again, we have satisfactory results here. 
Then I want to show you a test on pion decay process. On the top, you see the evolution of pion, neutrino mu number as a function of time. Here, we just inject pions at certain energies and observe the, it's, uh, the number, uh, particle number <clears throat> evolution through time. Uh, these vertical lines correspond to the pion decay time, and it is obvious that decay time is properly respected. On the bottom, you can see this for the same process, uh, a fractional error in uh, total number and total energy through time, uh, which is again says that uh, particle uh, number and energy are conser strongly conserved. Then we uh, tested our time dependent code on uh, very well studied blazers. Uh, so through the modeling, uh, all modelings, we adopted two scenarios. First, uh, so-called hadronic scenario, where proton synchrotron dominated uh, high, higher energies, and leptohadronic scenario, where secondary pairs emission put some constraint to the models. For the emission region, uh, we, we chose a single spherical uh, globe uh, moving with a constant Lorentz factor, filled with constant magnetic field, Protons and electrons are initially injected with single Paulo and Paulo with exponential cutoff spectra. And we track the particles and their secondaries for one dynamical time scale. The first SED we initiated to model is 2017 event for TXS of 506, which corresponds to one neutrino detection uh, by IceCube. On the top, you see the hadronic uh, model. Uh, this uh, blue uh, a solid line corresponds to the total emission, while these uh, red dashed lines uh, uh, correspond to the proton synchrotron, and uh, muon synchrotron is presented by uh, gray curves. Uh, their combination accounts for high energy data set. On the same plot, on the very right hand side, you can see muon neutrino uh, spectral evolution. On the bottom, you see uh, the leptohadronic scenario where low and high energy peaks are explained by synchrotron and cell synchrotron content processes, while uh, proton content, in this case, is uh, restricted by this uh, X-ray transient data set. Commonly, for hadronic models, uh, hadronic models require higher magnetic fields and larger uh, proton uh, energies, which is the case also uh, here. Uh, for the our uh, most optimistic scenario, we estimated a uh, 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 number to be 0.43, uh, which is in agreement with, uh, with ice cube detection. Then we uh, start to model uh, the second SED of the same source, uh, during which uh, ice cube detected almost 13 neutrinos. Here, this dot dashed line corresponds to the uh, electron secondary electron position contribution to the overall spectra. Uh, here, uh, this X-ray uh, uh, upper limit uh, somehow uh, challenges for one zone models to to reproduce both SED and number of neutrinos at the same time. Uh, for these models, for the optimistic scenario, we expect the neutrino number to be 3.3. Which is lower than uh, than what was observed. The next source is 3HSP, uh, which is a, a blazer, which is a high synchrotron peak blazer. That's why it needs a larger electron energies to be injected. We have analyzed and modeled gender, uh, three different periods: gender eight, ten, and eleven. Um, the main parameters that we estimated are identical to, to common hadronic models. Uh, only thing I would like to emphasize here that neutrino daily rate we estimated for this source to be 10 to minus 3, which is uh, again in agreement with, uh, the, with the observations. And the last, uh, uh, last source is 3C279, which is unlikely those two ones uh, have never been detected by IceCube. Uh, but we included it in the modeling because it showed prominent flare with the five minute duration. And uh, uh, 
from this uh, uh, variability time we uh, derived like uh, delta and uh, emission size regions which is depicted on the uh, right hand side and for this source we expect uh, we estimated the Chino daily rate to be about 0.15. To conclude, a new fully time dependent numerical self consistent code was presented, which has a broad applications. It can be applied to GRBs, blazers, etc. The multi messenger modeling for three very high energy natural candidate sources were shown. And uh, uh, what if you want to use the code? Uh, the code runs as a black box on a server to which we are ready to grant you access. Uh, it it uh, has a very uh, user-friendly interface with Python. Uh, the only condition is to be included in the development of a physical idea and to the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarkis, uh, for uh, this nice presentation and to be perfect in time. So I, I want to mention that uh, this code also is in real time cross-checked by comparing with results from Matteo, which is also good because this will be, have the cross-validation in a possible way. I see that there is a question by Matteo. So please, Matteo, go on. Uh, you are muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, now it's okay. Yeah, I have two questions. So the first one is, um, is, is the code single zone or can you add external fields and can you do external inverse Compton or external pi gamma? So we can do everything. So okay. it is just uh, time dependency solve this equation. So uh, the model scenario you can add uh, very easily. Okay. And the other question is uh, something that I understood from the, um, from the work we are doing on, on, on comparing codes is that um, here, do I, do I understand correctly that you let it evolve? If you go back to one of the first slide for one, basically for one one time scale, right? One, one uh, dynamical time scale. So you let it like one R over C, right? Exactly. But uh, did you try to go much larger than that? So th th the question is, are you sure that this is, at this stage you are at equilibrium or not? Uh, sure, we cannot be uh, sure that it is, it, uh, the state is in equilibrium, but uh, here uh, we can, uh, like um, proceed it uh, behind the one dynamical time scale, of course. Uh, the only thing at this stage or the code is that it's missing is uh, this is captures, which is like one hour to uh, to be included in the code and it can uh, run also uh, for longer times. Okay, okay. Well, then maybe you can discuss this offline because one of the things we were, of course, when you compare codes, for example, our code is a steady state. So when you compare it with um, with um, time dependent codes, uh, we need to make sure that we are comparing the same thing. So one sure. of the things we realized when compared with a code by Maria uh, Petropoulou um, mm -hmm. is that uh, usually when if we want to have exactly the same thing, uh, one dynamical time scale is not enough. So she always, at the beginning, I think she was always um, yeah, being a bit like short on this because of course it takes time. Uh, but I think uh, we, one of the conclusion was that she, she let it run by for, for several time scales to make, to make really sure that we can, it can be compared to what you get from a steady state code. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, yeah, I, I, my steady state code, basically it's infinity, right? I mean, it is computing mm -hmm. by solving the integral, the integral solution, which it's, I mean, which the T is really close to infinity. So it, it, there might be a difference also coming from that. Sure. So, so just to understand better, Matthew, you mean so when you let the system to involve more longer time scales, so that way well, you sure sure that you reach the equilibrium. Yes, this is your point. Yes. Right. Exactly. I mean, or if if you want, I mean, instead of because here, from what I understand, the test you did, you let it run from R over C or whatever is your time scale, and that's it. But then it you I mean, of course, then it, it as you have seen from the SED you show it 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 tends to the equilibrium, but then it can still go to be higher. And so oh, if you go to two R or C or three R or C or four R or C, it might be a bit up. So it's, oh, I agree. I mean, what, R over C, it's, it's a good first um, well, time scale. So you are not far from equilibrium, but maybe you can still still earn a bit 
um, in total luminosity by going a bit up. And so in practice, I think mm -hmm. it can also mean that you can go a bit down in luminosities. You will need a bit less protons because it, the flux will go a bit up. Uh, if it will keep growing. Okay. Hey, can I ask something too? Yes, yes, sure, sure, go ahead. Okay, perfect. Uh, I saw in your code while you were demonstrating the parameters that you use, uh, yes, here, that the gamma max is larger, very, very larger than the gamma, uh, the, than the gamma, uh, than the Lorentz factor for the electrons. How can you explain such differences in, a, in the same region? I mean, how do you accelerate something into 10 to the fourth and something else to 10 to the ninth? It's, it's, it's quite a lot. Okay, thank you for the question. So uh, this is the mystery of uh, hadronic pr processes where it requires larger magnetic, uh, larger magnetic field, larger uh, proton uh, energies and large energetics. So, uh, there are some uh, very good papers which discuss uh, the possible acceleration scenarios where uh, protons could be accelerated to such higher energies. So it is uh, it is already discussed in the literature. Um, okay. may, may I add something? So this comes from naturally from the because the electrons are, uh, I mean, easier to accelerate, but they are losing energy even faster. So even if okay. you have the same mechanism that if you put balance the cooling and acceleration, in the case of protons, the protons are less cooling. So you could just extend their energy to the higher bands. Okay. Instead, the electrons will cut faster. Mm -hmm. That's logical. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, for everyone. Are there any other questions? If not, once more, thank you very much, Sarkis, for this nice presentation. Then we move to the next presentation, which is uh, neutron emission from hydronic X-ray blazer flares. And the uh, speaker is Stamatios Lias uh, Sta, uh, Statopoulos. Sorry if I mispronounce your name. It's okay, yes. it's okay. <laughs> yes, uh, so uh, please share your screen. Okay, okay. so you can see my slides. Yes, so we see okay, very well, okay. and we see the, uh, well, it's not full screen, if you could make full screen, yes, yes. it would be okay. even better. Please, you have uh, 15 minutes, and I will notify you when you have two minutes left. Thank you. So, thank you. hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank the previous speakers for the very nice talks and the introduction. And today I'm going to discuss about the connection between high-energy neutrinos and hadronic X-ray blazer flares. So. In 2017, a high-energy neutrino was detected by IceCube that was coincident in both direction and time with a six-month gamma ray flare from laser TXA0506. But the flare was not only the gamma rays. Actually, it was a multi-wavelength flare, as you can see in the light curve of the source here. The dashed line is used to indicate the arrival time of the high-energy neutrino. After the detection, a follow-up archival search of IceCube data revealed the nexus of high-energy neutrinos with respect to the atmospheric background, of course, over a period of six months during 2014 and 15, coming from the same direction of, uh, of the region uh, from the blazer. During that time, the source was not flaring the gamma rays. And this brings us to the motivation of this work. Besides the neutrino excess during 2014 and 15 that was not accompanied by any gamma ray activity from the TXA source, more recently, a high energy neutrino was detected by ISQ, but it was found that in the asserted the arrival direction, there was a high signal or peak blazer that was undergoing several X-ray flaring episodes as the light curve indicates here. So you can see the average flux during another epoch of the source and the, the X-ray flux here at the time of the neutrino arrival. So you can see that it is two or three times greater than the average flux. Apart from observational growing evidence for a connection between ice cube neutrinos and blazers, there are also theoretical studies that predict neutrino emission from blazers, especially during flaring episodes. Mastichiadis and Petropoulou in 2020 showed that by using a Laurentian temporal profile in time for the protons distribution to simulate a flaring episode inside a spherical region with a uniform magnetic field, that this will power an X-ray flare by proton synchrotron radiation. The X-ray flare actually provides enough energetic target for photon motion interactions to occur with the relativistic protons. And this will give rise to a neutrino flare as well. So you, here you can see the X-ray flare, 
flare and the flux too. And here is the produced neutrino flare. Some of the conclusions of their work is that the peak of the neutrino flare is related to the energy of the protons and the magnetic field inside the source, something that is expected. And uh, also that during the X-ray flare, the bolometric luminosity of the neutrinos is comparable to the, to the X-ray luminosity. Uh, finally, uh, for compact emit emitting regions with strong magnetic fields, then the source becomes opaque in the gamma rays and the high energy neutrino flare may not have a bright gamma ray counterpart. Here we won't try to model all X-ray flares from lasers in order to find their neutrino flux. But we make the following assumptions based on the previous theoretical results. Here you can see the spectral energy distribution of Markarian 421 created using data from various instruments and epochs. The red points represent an X-ray flaring state as it will be defined later during my talk. We assume that all X-ray flares actually are produced by the synchrotron radiation of the proton population. And therefore, by using the synchrotron peak, we can find the Lorentz factor of the protons and also the characteristic energy of the emitted neutrinos. Then, by modeling the differential neutrino plus and the neutrino energy flux of all flavors as a power law with an exponential cutoff exactly at the characteristic neutrino energy, and by using the fact that the bolometric X-ray luminosity is comparable to the bolometric neutrino luminosity, we can make our predictions about the produced neutrino flux. So we begin with a synchrotron peak, and then by following all these steps, we find we make our predictions about the neutrino flux. As for the leptonic component of the, uh, of the source during the flare, we assume that this is responsible for the baseline emission. And that leads us to our sample. Our sample contains 66 pleasures that have been observed by Swift more than 50 times, obtained between uh, November 2004 and November 2020. In the old sky plot, you can see all of these 66 blazers presented as blue dots. So, we, as you can see, we have blazers in several declinations. Now, for our study, we use the light years of the 1 kV band to describe the X ray variability of each source and the integrated 0 0.5 up to 10 kV energy flux to compute the neutrino component. In the bottom of the slide, you can see a typical light here from Swift. And as you will notice, despite belonging to the sample of frequently observed blazers, there are some difficulties to overcome in order to characterize the variations inside the light here. First of all, the flux measurements are regular. That means that they're not evenly spaced in the time domain. Also, there are some large gaps between periods where flux measurements are available. So that means we may miss some characteristics of the light curve or some flaring activity. And finally, the number of all flux measurements seems to vary considerably from object to object. So just to give you an example, we have some objects with a few hundred measurements while others with a few thousand. In order to overcome the previous difficulties, we use the generalized version of Bayesian blocks to characterize all statistical significant variations inside the light curve. In other words, what Bayesian blocks do is that they divide the light curve in time windows or blocks of steady flux concerning the error of its measurement. This slide shows the light curve of Barcarian 41 and the light curve of PKS 1424, where we have applied the Bayesian blocks, which is represented by these orange solid lines. Uh, okay, now the next question is how do we recognize all flares in a light curve? And in order to do that, we use the mean and the standard deviation of all flux measurements of the same light curve. So we classify flares into two types based on the block flux as defined by the Bayesian blocks. More specifically, we define all variations that are between mu plus one sigma to mu plus three sigma as type A flares, while all variations that are above mu plus three sigma as type B flares. Just to give you an example of this, I will use the, mark the light curve of the TXS source. And here you can see that the blue solid line represents the mean value of all flux measurements. The dust line is used to indicate the mean plus one sigma level of all flux measurements. And also, and finally, the dust dotted line is used to indicate the mean plus three sigma level. Now, by applying the previous criteria, we find that this block and this block are actually type B flares, are characterized as type B flares, and these two blocks are type A flares. Okay. Now, the expected number of mu and plus anti-mu neutrinos from an X-ray flare can be calculated using this complicated formula. 
where the integration over time refers to all individual flux measurements inside the flaring block. Okay. Now, the neutrino flux is determined by the X-ray flux, as I have already discussed. And now that we have introduced the swift likens, we can look at this short movie. And you can see at the bottom panel uh, of the cartoon some that, that demonstrates actually type A flare in the light from Markarian 4 to 1. And at the top, you can see how the old flavor neutrino flux changes over time. This time, dependent on flavor neutrino flux is going to be used in order to make our predictions for this specific player. Now, because we have swift observations for certain sources since 2005, and that means before the starting date of Ice Cube operate, operations, uh, we therefore use different effective areas for our calculations depending on the configuration of Ice Cube at the time of the flare. Uh, for all the following results that I'm going to present to you, have used a constant value of 10 for both the magnetic field and the Doppler factor. So let's move on to the results. We found 967 flaring blocks, and here you can see the normalized distribution, normalized unity of duration at the top and fluxes at 1 kV at, of, uh, flux at 1 kV of blocks that are classified as flares at the bottom. Histograms of different flare types are displayed with different colors. So we use the orange color to indicate type B flares and the blue one to indicate type A flares. Um, now, looking at the top histogram, we can see that the mean duration of all flaring blocks, regardless of type, is one to five days. But generally speaking, type A flares, which are the less energetic variations inside the light curve, last longer compared to type B flares. Markarian 4 to 1 had the most flaring states and most type B flares. And you can see also the contribution of Markarian, this being this created by him. Now that we have gone through the basic characteristic of flares, we can move to the neutrino predictions. The figure shows the normalized distribution of the expected new and anti new neutrino number for all X ray flares. We find that the median of the total neutrino number is 0 0.02 events per flare. The left figure at the bottom shows the predicted number of mu and anti mu neutrino events from X ray flares as a function of the block's duration. As you can see, there is a linear relation of those two. And it's something that someone should expect since the larger duration block means also the larger flare in the neutrino, and a larger neutrino flare. Okay. Uh, what is clear here is that for a given duration, flares with higher X ray fluxes. Uh, sorry, different colors are used to indicate the 1 kV flux measurement during the flare. And by this, what is clear is that for a given duration, flares with higher X-ray fluxes are found to produce a higher number of events compared to flares with lower X-ray fluxes, which this actually reflects, reflects the model's main assumptions that during the X-ray flare, the bolometric luminosity of the X-rays is comparable to the bolometric luminosity of the neutrinos. The right bottom figure shows that the highest density is observed for durations between highest density in neutrino predictions is observed uh, in, for durations of flares between one to 10 days. So we started with a sample of 66 flares and by adding up all neutrinos coming from all individual flares from the sources, we find the following. Here you can see an old sky plot in equatorial coordinates, which shows the contribution of all sources to the old sky neutrino map. In the table, you can see the contribution of some interesting sources in our sample. And uh, also, I had to note that the sources that contribute more to the predictions is uh, the ones that have the more observations. This is due to the fact that flares from sources with poorer temporal coverage are more likely to be missed. So far, our predictions use the value of 10 for both the Lorentz factor and the magnetic field. But how actually magnetic field declination and the Lorentz factor affect our predictions? By replacing all the variables that are related to the magnetic field, we find that the number of neutrinos has a power law dependence, and then an exponential dependence with a square root of the magnetic field d to net integral, as you can see here. Of uh, the legends, you can see in the lenses, you can see the source index 
and here you can find the source name as well and the declination of each source. Of course, in order to have an analytical expression for the prediction for the predicted number of neutrinos versus the magnetic field, someone will need an analytical expression for the effective area. Okay, as you can see, there is a value um, for the magnetic field that is going to give the highest predicted neutrino number. And that value is related with the declination of the source, something that you can see in this bottom left figure here. More specifically, objects that are in lower declinations reach their peak of their predictions for smaller values of the magnetic field, while objects with, that are in higher declinations reach this value for higher values of the magnetic field. As for the Doppler factor, its effects are less pronounced in the range of values expressed for laser jets as on this figure here. To conclude, what we have done here is that using a sample of 66 blazers, we have classified their flaring activity into two types. Then by assuming that its flaring activity is produced by hadronic population, we presented our predictions for the expected neutrino signal from X-ray blazer flares using a recently proposed theoretical scenario. According to the scenario, according to this scenario, all X-ray flares are powered by synchronous radiation of intermittently accelerated protons that find production on their own synchronous radiation, thus resulting in a high energy neutrino flare as well. We found that we expect 0.02 events per X-ray flare, and finally we discussed about how the model parameters affect our predictions. And we found that Doppler factor doesn't affect our predictions that much, but the magnetic field seems that there's a value for the magnetic field that maximizes our predictions. So thank you very much. And I'm hearing your questions. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. And thank you to be uh, perfect in time. So, but please just, uh, continue to share your screen. Maybe someone has ah, a, a yes, question yes. about- Yes, yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Slide, yes. uh, is there any question? Uh, 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 I don't see any hand raised, but I have myself a question. Can you please go to the slide where you show this Bayesian block division of the X-ray? Oh, uh, okay, Matteo, okay. My, uh, I asked and Matteo, you... Yeah, yeah, go of ahead. The, okay. Of the 1K Villages. So here Yes. Go. Okay, uh, my question is, okay, as far as I understood, the, you divided the light curves in these blocks, you mm -hmm. identified the flowering periods, and you used this time to compute the expected nature numbers, am I right? Exactly. But uh, yes. we use the 1 kV light curves as indicators of the variation. We don't use the 1 kV flux in order to find the neutrino flux, let's say. Okay. We, okay. okay. I, I, well, I answer, so, so you mean the flux level are not correlated with 1 kV flux, but the, you identify the times using 1 kV flux, right? Yes, yes, exactly. We use the light curves just to describe the variability and to, fly, to find all flaring states inside the light curve. In order to find the neutrino flux, we use the integrated 0 0.5 up to 10 kV. Okay. I see. I see. Which actually this represents that the model from Mastichiades and Petropoulou where they found that actually the X-ray luminosity is compared to the neutrino luminosity. And as X-ray scares, I mean the 0 0.5 up to 10 kV. I see. Uh, I was wondering, okay, in the case of Markarian, Markarian is an exceptional source because it was more, uh, observed by Swift more than a thousand times, so you could have this nice division, but yes, I think exactly. for, for, for the other sources, you would mm -hmm. have this big gap between the, the observation. So I was wondering exactly. if you, okay, one, okay, you see one day, one observation, you see flare, then you don't have a data, then you see another observation, yes. and how you deal with this middle point? You just consider them in a flaring state? So, this is a complicated question, but I will try to answer it as good as possible. So you can see that actually Bayesian blocks, they divide your light curve into segmentations. And we use actually these segmentations in order to describe uh, the flux during uh, that given duration of the block. So every mm -hmm. segmentation that you see here represent somehow the flux during this period of the source, okay? So, after visual inspection of all light curves that we have applied to the Bayesian blocks, we found that indeed there are some blocks like this one here, 
where you can see you have only one data point and then there is zero. So what we did was actually to exclude these blocks from our analysis. Sorry, and let me go. And here you can see actually that the histograms doesn't change a lot. Here you can see the contribution of these large blocks here. Mm -hmm. All, okay, so we have done this and thank you for asking because it was something written in the details. Okay, so okay. yes, we neglect all this, uh, let's say, behavior that we are not sure what, is going, what was going on during the time of the lecture. Thank you very much. So, Matteo, please go on. Hi. Yeah, you guys. Hi. Right. Yes. Hi. So, I have a question on your on your hypothesis, if I understand it correctly. So, here you the hypothesis you make is that all your X-ray players are proton synchrotron, right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So, do you predict mm -hmm. gamma ray flares associated to the X-ray players? So. Yes, because then we would, uh, if we would try to do this, actually we would go in modeling all the sources, but we keep it simple here. And as I have already mentioned, Mastichel and Metropoulou in their work, they found that not all flaring episodes are, uh, are having a gamma ray counterpart, uh, counterpart, as you can see. Okay, here. The, the, this I agree. So especially, this is, I think, especially true for the TV part, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Because exactly. it's heavily absorbed. So my, my point is then you do have the information on the TV, especially for Markarian 421, uh, you have like a lot of data from Cherenkov telescope, exactly, exactly. Arc, public light group. So mm -hmm, cannot mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. use this to identify the flares that are not adronic? Thank you for this. So uh, you might know the data and you would also know that the gamma rays data are been into seven days, I think, are, are data that have been been into seven. I mean, uh, well, it depends on the flux. I agree on the low state. Yes, yeah, yes, right. depends on the flux. But as I have already shown, we have find, we found variabilities that are between one to two days. So we may miss some characteristics in the gamma rays coming from these events. So yes, we neglect the gamma ray activity and. Uh, and also the gamma ray field, uh, let's say um, photon field for okay. uh, as, as targets for our, uh, yes. Okay, well, I mean, it's, it's maybe something you j j just for, for if, you, if you want to take into account. I mean, I think that especially from the TV, I mean, for Fermilat, especially for these kind of hard sources is, is not very um, useful because you don't see a lot of flares. You are seeing the low energy part of the SED. Uh, exactly. But for the TV band, uh, there are public data. So there are uh, uh, fact light curves are there. And I think also Veritas uh, is uh, releasing the archival data they have. So you can identify uh, at least the flares that correspond to a clear TV flare. And we see that. I mean, we, we have published uh, several papers showing that we do see correlation between the X-rays and the TV band. So mm -hmm. I think that's my personal opinion. Eh? But whenever you see a clear X-ray flare with a TV flare, it is supporting an SSC scenario. Yes, yes. So electronic case. So maybe mm -hmm. I think this can be helpful to to at least try to identify which are the because I think this can, can be a, a, a beautiful uh, emission scenario for orphan X-ray flares, when you have exactly. something flaring in X-ray that is not flaring in the gammas. But when you mm -hmm. do see the gamma counterpart. I think this scenario is disfavored because mm -hmm. you, you do see the flare. So that's that, that something has to be produced. So unless you have like joint proton synchrotron and SSC flaring, it, it can be very difficult. So I think mm -hmm. it, it might be something you want to look at, at least to, to, to have an idea of how often does this occur. Yes, I totally agree with you, especially in the well sampled uh, objects like Smart Yes, like Mark yes. was one, I agree. Yes, yes. thank you. Yes. Uh, Thank you. I have an additional question. Can you show, please, the slide where you show the magnetic field dependence on the number of neutrinos? Of course. Okay. 
So we're here. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So you mentioned that this number of neutrinos depends on the magnetic field power, one minus S. Uh, this, I presume this S is the spectral index in the X-ray band, of, right? No, yeah. it, it is the, actually it is the, um, the uh, neutrino index. Oh, oh, I see. So the neutrino this index. Magnetic, this magnetic field actually comes from, from the characteristic neutrino energy which is de actually depends on the protons, Lorentz factor, and the magnetic yeah, fields and so, the source. Okay, I see, I see, okay, okay, now I understood, okay, so I was, okay, so this is the, the index of the... Yes, Neptunus. something interesting here, and I thought that they didn't have time, so if I may, I can explain yes, this. Sure, sure. You can see the solid lines and then the dotted lines. So yes. solid lines represent the values of magnetic field that actually are uh, satisfying the energy threshold for pion, uh, for pion protections. And by, in order to understand this, let me tell you the following. Let's say you have a given synchrotron peak, and as you increase the magnetic field, that requires to drop the, Lorentz proto uh, the energy of the protons into lower mm -hmm. values. So you may fall under this energy threshold. So the higher the magnetic field goes for, uh, uh, for a given synchrotron peak, then you may lose that uh, threshold in order to pine produce your in order yeah, to sure. for Be yeah. because you increase the the magnetic field so you decrease the other components so then you uh, you, you could reach in some regime that mm -hmm. you don't produce any more neutrinos efficiently yes exactly yes thank you very much for this nice presentation so then now it's time to that we move to the next speaker so uh, our next speaker is Antonio Galvan, searching correlation between high energy neutrino detected by ice cube and for catalog of Fermi Lat sources. So, Antonio, please uh, share your screen. Uh, Matteo, I see that your hand is still raised, so it is pre from previous time, or you have still questions? No, sorry, sorry. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, I think, Antonio, you are muted, so. Okay, now, uh, yes. can, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, now we can see full screen and we can hear you. So please, we have a 15 minutes. I will notify you when you have two minutes left, okay? Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, hello everybody. My name is Antonio Garvan. Uh, thanks for your presence in this talk title, uh, search correlating uh, between high energy neutrinos detected by IceCube and for lack Fermi lag sources. Uh, actually, this work is part of my PhD thesis under the supervision of the Professor Nipsin Freja and the Institute of Astronomy at Yunnan, Mexico. Also, I want to thank to the Marcel Grossman Committee to bring me the space to, to, uh, to, to do this talk. So, the motivation. Uh, we are motivated uh, by the spatial and, uh, time and, and time correlation observed between the ice cube neutrino IC 7079 22A detected in a spatial and time correlation with the blazer TXC 0506 plus 066 uh, when this blazer was in the first state, as the previous speaker mentioned. Uh, so, our objective is answer the following question uh, Can the blazer detected by Fermilite light produce neutrinos as the TXC 0506 plus 056 blazer? So, in order to solve this uh, question, we, we, we're going to study uh, the, the SQ neutrinos. Um, in particular, uh, as you know, the topology of the event detected by ice cube is associated with the kind of neutrino that interact with the ice nucleum, uh, as this uh, picture shows. Yes, so we are focusing on neutrinos that have they have a median angular resolution error less than two degrees at the reconstructed position in the sky. So we can see here in the sky plot, we can notice that uh, this kind of points is uh, represent a uh, mono neutrino. In other hand, uh, shower events associated to electron neutrinos, uh, they have uh, several errors in the uh, region of the direction arrive of the neutrino. So uh, this uh, we we wanna we we gonna avoid these uh, neutrinos because they have a huge error. So to date, uh, more than 185 neutrinos have been reported by IceCube in several catalogs, in particular the HESE catalog is the science publication in 2012. Uh, 32 more neutrinos in the HESE catalog, uh, then 23 neutrinos and 11 uh, neutrinos uh, via HESE among uh, notification. 
and since uh, last two years, uh, the uh, alert moved to bronze alert and gold alert that these events have a uh, 30% of probability to, to begin uh, uh, of an origin astrophysical and 50% uh, to be an astrophysical event. So for those neutrinos, only for the ice cube uh, event IC17792A uh, was detected with the uh, blazer TXS uh, 0506 plus 066 was in flare state as we can see in the cartoon. We, we can see here uh, the multi wavelength light curve of this object. We can see from radio to very high energy gamma rays uh, near to the uh, detection of the neutrino represented by a red the dashed line. In the light curve, we can see the, the flare state. And in particular, uh, one issue with this association uh, the, of this object uh, is because Ice Cube, uh, in a posterior analysis, searched in the archival data in this direction of the sky and found a neutrino flare uh, of the length uh, of months in duration. Uh, uh, representing this uh, gray column, and um, uh, a different in a different behavior show it than in 2017. Uh, this blazer doesn't show uh, any flying activity in, in this period. So, the way to associate the neutrinos with electromagnetic counterpart is via spectral energy distribution uh, via the seat of this object of the arrival of the neutrino. We can see here uh, two different models to describe this neutrino proposed by Gao, and depends on the model of the hadronic component or a leptonic component, we expect a, a different kind of neutrino flux. In particular, uh, to, to solve this question of, of the world, uh, we are going to work with Fermilat uh, data. Uh, one advantage of use these data is because Fermilat uh, uh, operates in a energy range from 2000 MEPS to 500 GBs. Uh, it has an instant, to, in instant file of view of the sky of the 20% uh, of the sky. It covers the entire sky in three hours. And uh, Fermilat uh, now have more than, uh, more than 10 years of operation. And we have uh, public data or ability data. Uh, so this is, uh, we can, uh, access easily to this data. So up to date, four catalogs were released for the Fermilab collaboration, three of them in the energy range uh, from 200 MEPS to 500 GBs. And the last one, the four FGL and the second data release, uh, take into consideration the first uh, eight and 10 years of operation respectively of uh, sources in the sky in the energy range from 50 MAVs uh, from one TV. So they made an improve in the energy range, uh, energy range to detect uh, these sources. So uh, in this cartoon, we can see uh, the spatial distribution of these sources. We can see here uh, uh, in this uh, um, purple points, the data or the object uh, belongs uh, to the four lakh uh, catalog. This catalog only contains uh, uh, active galactic nuclei. Uh, it's a subset of the four FGL uh, catalog. And this uh, 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 catalog uh, comprises more than 3,000 uh, objects, in which one, more than 1,000 uh, of these objects are being uh, blazers, BLX, and more than 1,200 are candidates to blazer. Meanwhile, uh, there are another subset of this uh, catalog is called the low latitude ca uh, catalog. And this uh, sample have uh, near to 300 objects in which one uh, 56 are blazer objects and, two, and more than 200 are candidates to be in uh, blazer objects. So the main goal is use, uh, to, uh, use these two, two catalogs in order to find a spatial correlation. Uh, this is uh, look at the neutrino position and look for all the Fermilat sources that are uh, closer in, uh, in a spatial, uh, in angular separation than the error reported by Ice Cube by the neutrino. We can see here an example in which one uh, we um, mark the neutrino position with a cross. Great. 
uh, and separated with a red point uh, to the source. And for this uh, correl spatial correlations, uh, we, we built the, the broadband uh, set energy distribution of this object from radio to very high energy gamma rays. And we wanted to, we wanted to try to fit uh, these uh, uh, sets, uh, assuming two different scenarios. Well, uh, first of all, this uh, we found uh, near that uh, 20 neutrinos have uh, a candidate to be uh, to have an con electromagnetic counterpart uh, detected by Fermilat. And those correlations must be constrained uh, with uh, physical parameters. So uh, this is the way that we must uh, constrain these numbers. This, uh, we need to note that this correlation doesn't imply that the counterpart can be a neutrino progenitor. So we are looking uh, from uh, radiative processes. We are starting uh, for a leptonic model. Uh, we adopt the leptonic model derived by Finke in 2008. Uh, uh, Finke uh, tried to describe the low energy of the set with a synchrotron radiation and the high uh, and the second component of, or the second bump of the set assuming a, a synchrotron set Compton model, uh, the, the uh, uh, product of the electrons uh, in the jet uh, interacting with the radiated uh, photons from synchrotron. And if the set aggregates with a purely leptonic model, we must discard this source as neutrino progenitor. Uh, we are going to feed, uh, we, we feed uh, this uh, model using immunity interface. Uh, there is a minimizer uh, uh, derived by the, by the software uh, root by the sun. So uh, it's the case in, in when the set uh, agrees with a purely leptonic uh, scenario. Uh, if the set uh, needs an extra component, in which case we have an example here, we adopt a lepto, uh, an adronic component in order to obtain a leptoadronic model. Uh, in this case, we adopt the model derived by Keller and Anorian, that is a parametrization of the SOFIA code. Uh, we, we expect that this uh, photodronic interaction uh, pro, uh, produce uh, multi-pion processes. Uh, so in this channel, we have neutral pions, and these pions produce a high energy gamma rays that we expect that describe this second bond in the set. And also, we, we expect uh, to create a charged pion, a pions that uh, produce these more neutrinos, and these mons and the muons produce more mons and positrons. Uh, there are the respective flux. So we are to, uh, we are to to compare uh, this, this theoretical flux with the neutrinos um, detected by ice cube. And um, uh, there is, if comparable, we try to uh, uh, describe the, the time of the, the necessary time to ice cube uh, detect a neutrino from this direction of the, of the, of the sky. Uh, also, we are looking for uh, episodes of flares. In particular, we are using Fermi Pi, this uh, Python interface to derive a lot of public data, uh, assuming a binary likelihood analysis in order to do analysis in a long uh, period of time of data. It, we, it, this intention is try to find a possible failures uh, near to the uh, detection of the, of the arrival of the neutrino uh, as the possible uh, counterpart candidate. And, if there is a, a if, if, if we uh, uh, try to derive the spectra and try to build uh, the more quasi contemporaneous uh, photons sets in order to describe these possible uh, flares as some, 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 uh, some of the idea of the previous speaker. So finally, uh, we find a special, co a special correlation between high energy neutrino uh, events uh, track events detected by SQ with blazer that emit in high energy uh, range detected by Fermilat. Uh, also, quasi simultaneous sets are being uh, derived around the neutrino arrival time in order to describe them with the same radiative model. Also, we are looking, uh, we are working in a Python library that implements these radiative processes handed to the community if someone is, so is anyone wants to to use it. And also Bayesian blocks are uh, begin up, applied to the light curve detected by Fermi 
Fermilat in order to find uh, possible flare episodes around the neutrino arrival time. Uh, and, uh, and that's all. Thanks for your for the attention. Uh, uh, also, thanks. Uh, also, excuse me for the for the no, thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much for this nice presentation. Thank you for being in perfect time. So, uh, is there any question? Well, until the people ask, I, I, I have myself questions. So, uh, okay. let me better understand. So, you actually take the neutrino events, the direction. You see which sources detected by Fermi are in the error region. Yeah. Then you say that you are doing the leptonic modelings, the, the sources which cannot be modeled by leptonic models, then you move to the hadronic. Am I yes. right? Yes, it's correct. Okay, uh, but the, the Finke 2008 that you mentioned that is the self synchrotron quantum modeling. Am I right? Yeah. Do you use this, this principle? So uh, let's say how, how you define that is not possible to model by SEC because I think in SEC, by changing a lot of parameters, you could really find the uh, a modeling, which is the criteria that you use. And for a second, imagine that you have a FSRQ that is better explained with external compound. So if you apply SEC, you don't find a good representation, then you move to Hadronic or you test also the external Compton scenarios. Yes, thank you for the question. Yes, actually, uh, I, I try to, to fit, uh, obtain the chi square uh, best fit uh, to this model from Finke using it minute, the interface. Um, and if the, the criteria to move to a leptohadronic scenario is a little tricky because uh, I expect that the, the sources that uh, need to um, uh, adronic component shows a uh, behavior here. This, well, this is a very, very um, ad hoc uh, cartoon because it's clear here that the leptonic scenario doesn't fit, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't fit very well the, 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 the mission here. Uh, and yes, this this is a little tricky. This is a, a little a criterion by by eye. Uh, I I don't I don't know for the moment how to justify this uh, criteria to move to adronic uh, uh, component more than the she square uh, fit. And also for the other uh, for the other question, uh, yes, um, for the moment I I, I don't uh, try to to implement an external Compton, but also I try to this I, I try to work in this in a future in a near future. Also, I want to try to to work with the um, photon photon uh, no the Blete Hater uh, um, uh, scenario in order to 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 have a, another component here in, in in low energies. Thank you. I mean, Matteo asked the same question that I wanted to ask. Which is the source that you showed in this? Slide. This. This is which source is this? This is this is one. This one. Yes. This one. Which source is this? This, this one? is uh, W comma. Which one? W comma. Oh, W comma. Okay, I see. Uh, well, uh, uh, are there other questions? No. Then we thank again the speaker. So now. Uh, by the program, we have to we, we have a break. Uh, so since we were extended the time, let's make the break a little bit shorter. So we, if it is okay, we come back at uh, eight ten. So we will have a seven minutes of break. So this is a good time to grab a cup of coffee or tea. Then we come back and we continue with the next speakers. Okay. So see you in uh, seven minutes. Hello, Narek. Um, I'm Alexander Ply, and I'm a speaker of the next uh, session. Can yes, I yes. try and test that everything works, right? Sorry, so, yes, sure, sure. You can should start. So to I assume you can hear me, right? And see yes. me? Yes, I can see and I can hear you. And um, you can see my slide, right? Yes, I see a full screen, your presentation. I think everything works perfect. Great, thank you. Very good. So welcome back everyone. So this is the time that we start the second half of uh, presentations. So our next speaker is Alexander Lavin. So he's going to speak about radio neutrino synergy. Neutrinos are produced in numerous bright lasers. So please Alexander, share your screen and unmute yourself because you are muted. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, 
please start. I will notify you when you have two minutes left. Then we have five minutes for the questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Alexander Plavin. Good morning, everyone. I'm a PhD student in Moscow, and uh, today I'd like to talk about our recent result on uh, neutrino blazer connection that was made uh, possible uh, by radio observations. Uh, I thank previous speakers for a very nice introduction so that I can be very brief in this part of my talk. But I need to mention that we study that we rely on ice cube neutrino observations at energies from tetra electron volts to pet electron volts, basically the whole energy range covered by ice cube. And uh, our main interest in this studying these neutrinos as astrophysicists is uh, that they are one of the most direct probes of ultra relativistic protons. Of course, uh, uh, IceCube and other telescopes have been detecting these neutrinos for more than a decade, a decade already. And the question is, uh, where do they come from? Uh, what are the dominant sources of these astrophysical neutrinos? Uh, and uh, clearly, there are um, uh, several uh, hypotheses and possible explanations uh, that uh, have been existing for, again, many decades. And one of these hypotheses already explained today is that they may come from blazers. And uh, maybe blazers accelerate not only electrons, but also protons to ultra relativistic energies. And this is uh, the underlying motivation why we attempt to find the um, associations and study them. Uh, of course, there were also previous observational searches uh, trying to uh, tie blazers uh, in the sky to neutrino uh, detections. And uh, most of the uh, prior work were based on uh, comparison between neutrinos and gamma rays. And it makes sense because the uh, gamma rays uh, are produced at the same time as neutrinos are. And um, uh, there were numerous work comparing uh, fermi led data to ice cube uh, detections. I put several abstracts here on the right. And the, basically, the main result is there, there is no systematic association. There is no association of uh, gamma ray blazers as a class with the uh, neutrino detections. And um, the only outlier in the sense for a long time was the TXS of 506 blazer that is also gamma bright it's radio bright it is flaring at just the right time as we already heard today so um, after several years uh, of main, combining many observations it become a, became a very reliable identification so but this is the only one and it wasn't reliable really reliable at first uh, without uh, lots of supplementary information so still no systematic session was found for quite a long time. And our approach, our, uh, our proposal was to use uh, radio observations and specifically VLBI, that is very long with line interferometry. VLBI is a unique uh, method in the whole astronomy that allows us to directly resolve um, central parsec scale regions in uh, active galactic nuclei at cosmological distances. That is uh, central parsecs of uh, these objects. And um, this means that if we uh, did see some flux in uh, VLBI observation, it uh, uh, unambiguously comes from the very central parts, the, uh, the very central parts close to the jet origin, close to the supermassive black hole. Um, and uh, another side effect is that uh, VLBI observations tend to select bright blazers specifically. That is not any active galactic nuclei, but uh, those with jets pointed towards us. And uh, this is why we propose to use VLBI. Um, I'll briefly mention what kind of data we use. So from the radio, si radio side, we use a complete flux density limited sample of almost three and a half thousand blazers uh, that are basically uniformly distributed across the sky. Uh, here, uh, I show them in uh, gray dots. You can see that they are basically everywhere. Uh, this is based on the historic observations of more than 30 years at VLBI. And uh, as for neutrino, we used the uh, two ISCO data sets that uh, were available at the time. Uh, one is the uh, highest energy events above uh, 200 tera electron volts. And these are mostly the so-called alert or alert-like events. Uh, we gathered uh, 57 events uh, uh, filtered by um, angular resolution and uh, uh, covering about 10 years. It was estimated by ice cubes that about half of these events are of astrophysical origin. For, as for lower energies, uh, we use the uh, um, old sky map based on ice cube likelihood evaluations. 
um, and uh, it incorporates data for uh, seven years observations. And in this map, uh, for each direction in the sky, there is a likelihood that a you know, point source is located in the direction. Um, uh, it was estimated by ice cubes that events on the, with energies on the order of 10 tetraelectron volts dominate in these map calculations. So uh, we use uh, these two data set to test the hypothesis whether neutrinos uh, tend to arrive uh, uh, systematically closer um, from the direction of bright blazers or, or not. And uh, we find in our analysis that indeed this uh, spatial correlation is present. Uh, we find it in both data sets, both uh, high energy events and low energy events. And uh, we infer that, that uh, neutrinos are produced by blazers because how else they could be uh, spatially correlated to them. So um, to put it into somewhat more details, we find that the uh, highest energy alert like events, um, blazers clo close to the specific events are brighter than average blazer in the sky. And I illustrate this with my plot to the right. So uh, here with the uh, black arrow, black triangle, I show the average flux of AG of blazers within neutrino, within ice cube error regions. So this is about 05 Janskis. And with this uh, blue, uh, blue line and it's uh, one, one sigma intervals, I show the same uh, average, but for AGN outside of neutrino regions. And um, with the Monte Carlo analysis, we find that the, this difference is significant at the uh, with p-value of 0.2% post trial. Um, so indeed, this means that neutrino, blazers close to neutrinos are brighter than average. Um, for the lower energy maps, it, it doesn't contain individual events, so we ap apply a somewhat different approach, but uh, we also find the statistically significant correlation of blazers with uh, ice cube neutrino likelihood in that map. And we make a special consideration that uh, these two analyses on, based on high energy events and on lower energy events are statistically independent in terms of ice cube data they use. And after ensuring that this is the case, we combine them as statistically independent analysis and arrive with a joint p-value, joint significance of uh, four times 10 to the minus five of uh, chance coincidence. Um, another interesting point in this analysis, which may be important for uh, others who uh, use ice cube data to, I, I, ice cube event data to compare with some catalogs is that it's, uh, it, it may be important to account for systematic errors in ice cube arrival directions. Uh, that is, uh, the catalogs of ice cube typically contain only stati uh, statistical or stochastic uncertainties. However, it was uh, acknowledged uh, long ago that uh, there is some systematic errors present as well, mostly related to um, properties of ice. And we attempt to uh, roughly estimate and uh, these systematic errors as well by uh, expanding the provided uncertainty regions for each event uh, the, uh, the show here is with blue ellipses. And this uh, expansion uh, magnitude, so to say, uh, how much to expand each event is originally unknown, of course. So we fit uh, the best value of uh, this uh, expansion uh, magnitude as part of our analysis. We find that it's uh, close to 0.5 degree. That is uh, actually in a uh, uh, great agreement with uh, upper limits on their systematics that are of order one degree and um, also we've heard from others that this 0.5 degree sounds reasonable. Um, so this may be important for um, other similar studies. After having established that there is indeed some spatial correlation between blazers, bright blazers and neutrinos, and we ask the question like how many blazers emit these neutrinos, how many blazers drive this correlation? And for the uh, higher and uh, the higher energy events, we can even explicitly list the four blazers, the four uh, brightest uh, blazers within the uh, ice cube error regions uh, that I name here and also here uh, as those that drive the correlation. Because if we drop them, we uh, uh, get rid of all the correlation here. And the, uh, one of them, the brightest here is a 3C279, um, uh, uh, that is a very well-known blazer. I know that the, uh, the first neutrino association, uh, TXS 0506, is not among those brightest blazers because its average flux density is only 
0.5 Jansky, so it's uh, just uh, close to the average, effectively. Um, but we'll see a little more what can we tell about that. Um, as for as for neutrinos at the uh, lower energies, the uh, old sky map, we find that uh, many tens of blazers are associated with those neutrinos. It's hard to explicitly lead them because the uh, signal to noise ratio is much lower at the lower energies. But still, uh, we find this uh, um, this quantitative estimate uh, fairly reliable. And uh, using again a very rough order of magnitude estimates, we find that there can be enough blazers in the sky to explain the whole astrophysical neutrino flux uh, detected by Ice Cube. Um, it that doesn't. Uh, we don't claim that blazers are the only uh, or, or the only dominant uh, source of astrophysical neutrinos, but it's possible there are enough blazers to produce uh, enough uh, uh, neutrino flux. Um, so, uh, moving to the next part of uh, uh, my talk, I will talk about um, when, at what moments in time, blazers produce neutrinos. So, we move from spatial correlation to temporal correlation. For uh, TXSO506, um, it's well known that it was flaring at, uh, in many uh, different uh, electromagnetic wave, uh, wavelengths, especially, specifically in radio as well. So neutrino came at the beginning of a major radio flare. And also there were theoretical predictions, thesis paper for a review, that uh, neutrinos may, uh, should indeed come from uh, at the time of flares in the central parts of AGM. So, um, Luckily, we, we can um, evaluate this hypothesis by uh, um, temporally correlating ar neutrino arrival times with uh, radio flux density changes. Uh, first, uh, uh, I will briefly tell about what can we in principle expect to see here. That is an um, explanation of uh, how blazer flares look in radio in general. So in radio, we don't see to the very central parts so or like, uh, uh, a fraction of parsecs. This is optically thick. It's opaque to radio waves. And at different radio frequencies, uh, at, uh, with increasing radio frequency, we see closer and closer to the central black hole. This means that uh, higher radio frequencies probe closer regions uh, and flux densities, uh, flux changes at higher frequencies are stronger and uh, occur faster. This can be seen in this uh, radio light curve uh, that higher frequencies uh, change first and uh, the changes are stronger. And also these uh, spectra plots, uh, the spectrum at higher frequencies is uh, more variable. So if we see, if, we, if there is indeed some temporal correlation, we expect to see it strongest at the highest available frequency. So we uh, uh, perform uh, temporal analysis on, on the basis of uh, monitoring at the uh, Rotan 600 radio telescope on, in northern uh, Caucasus. And um, we compute the effectively average radio flux density uh, around some time, uh, uh, in some time around neutrino, neutrino arrival from the same direction. And on the vertical axis, I plot this, uh, this average flux density averaged over all radio sources that fall within ice cube error regions. So clearly there is a strong peak around the zero delay that is um, at the highest frequency with is that the radio flux density increases at the same time uh, when neutrino arrives from the same direction. And this effect uh, shown here is uh, integrated averaged over all blazers, but it's strongest for the PKS1502 blazer that in the uh, last year became um, uh, well known for, the, for this reason. Uh, uh, very recently, we got an independent confirmation based on completely different radio observations that they also see a temporal correlation of the same kind. So it's uh, works as expected. I will briefly mention um, uh, the uh, main physical interpretations, physical implications for blazer astrophysics that we derive from our observations. Uh, first, you, you have, have a two, two minutes left. Sorry, two minutes. Yeah, great. I'm, okay. I'll be just in time. Um, so we, we infer that neutrinos are produced in central parsecs of bright blazers because we find the first we find the correlation with um, VLBI blazers and second we find a temporal correlation with radio flares on the scales of months and years. They can only uh, arise in central parsecs due to causality reasons. 
As we find correlation with uh, Wilbei blazers, uh, this suggests that neutrinos are emitted not, uh, um, uh, not, not isotropically, but predominantly along the jet direction. And uh, this was also uh, theoretically predicted long ago, actually. Um, a very wide uh, range of energies observed of observed neutrinos put uh, strong constraints on uh, models that um, can produce them. I won't go into all details we show in this um, in this uh, schematic, but uh, mainly this requires uh, photons of uh, kilo electron volt energy range. Maybe these are the synchrotron thrust of photons in the jet, and also protons of uh, very high energies, ten to sixteen electron volts. It's, uh, as I understand, an open question of how they can be accelerated this, this much. Um, all right, so now I'm moving to my conclusion and summary. If you only remember one, um, one point from my talk, I want this to be this uh, highlighted message. It is the neutrinos of a wide energy range from tera electron volts to petal electron volts are produced in central parsecs of bright blazers. Specifically, we find that more than uh, 80 blazers uh, uh, can already be associated with ice cube neutrinos. Very recently, we get and are still getting intriguing results with other neutrino telescopes such as Antares and Baikal. Uh, they are, th those collaborations are going to report uh, on the ICRC conference next week. And uh, I stress that jet observations, especially radio and DLGI observations, we are key to this uh, neutrino blazer association. Um, so I won't uh, repeat the physical conclusions again, but I would uh, like to uh, also mention that we, uh, we work and start, start to work closely with all three uh, major lar largest neutrino telescopes that is Ice Cube, Antares and Baikal and uh, start to get uh, some interesting results uh, there as well. And uh, we, we ourselves continue to um, perform VLBI and single dish radio monitoring campaigns. So, uh, so we uh, introduce, a, a, so let's say radio point of view to the neutrino community and uh, introduce these, um, so spread the neutrino point of view in the uh, radio observation community. And um, generally both the present and the future of uh, this topic looks very uh, bright and uh, promising and interesting. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm over. Thank you very much for a nice presentation on this. Uh, there are questions? I don't see yet the hand raised. I have myself question. Can you please move to the slide where you show this 22 gigahertz correlation? Okay, here. Yeah. So uh, can you comment here a bit more? So uh, basically what I understood, so you say that for all sources, you see this strong uh, uh, correlation, but it's more evident for this PEC is 15 or two, am I right? Well, uh, we see not for all sources, we see this on average. So uh, mm -hmm. this plot is produced that we take for each uh, blazer that was monitored in this campaign mm -hmm. uh, and falls within ice cube error regions of some event, some high energy event. Um, we, we just uh, calculate the average flux density with uh, some time around neutrino with uh, some time shifts. And then average this flux, uh, th this normalized flux density across all sources that fall within these error regions. So this is an average plot. So on average, we see among a few tens of uh, radio blazers that fall within error regions uh, that there is uh, on average a temporal correlation on the order of months or so. And uh, we, we, don't have we don't have enough signal to noise ratio to reliably. Sorry. So there was no noise, so I muted. So yeah. you could continue. To, to, to reliably list all sources with uh, which uh, have significant temporal correlation, we can, for now we can only make an average claim. But among individual sources, the strongest but still not significant individually uh, is a correlation for PKS 1502. And oh, second strongest is for the excess of 506. Oh, yeah, OK. Uh, but we are not the only ones driving this relation. I see. Uh, I have other questions. So you, you identify these blazers that they are very close, the radio band, the blazers that they're close to neutrino event. Have you looked at the other bands, how these blazers behave, or you are just interested in radio? 
Well, of course, we looked at other wavelengths, especially at Fermi because at the gamma ray, because Fermi observes all the sky all the time, so it, mm -hmm. it has everything. And we find that all or almost all of these blazers are Fermi detected, so they are reasonably gamma bright. But um, uh, there is uh, uh, little to say outside of that. So they have very diverse gamma ray properties. Uh, they are detected by Fermi, but the flux differs by a few orders of magnitude. Oh, I see, I see, okay. And uh, we would like to look at the systematic um, survey and monitoring at X-ray, but, uh, well, there is no telescope that observes all the sky all the time. True, true. Okay, very interesting. Are there uh, other questions? Yes, Matteo, please go Hi. on. Hi, thanks a lot. Very, very nice talk. So um, can you, probably I think it was the last slide you show about the physical interpretation. So um, yes, this one. So to me is still, I, I, I think I didn't understand yet um, the implication of your results. So basically, I think you say that it is um, understandable, or at least you, you, we can give a reason of why we don't see a correlation with the gamma rays. Oh, yeah, I, I didn't uh, cover this point in much details, but indeed, um, there is an understanding. And uh, uh, as I understand, more and more uh, people start uh, sharing this. Um, basically, gamma rays are indeed produced uh, at the same uh, process as uh, neutrinos are. So uh, we, we have uh, protons, they interact with uh, Q electron volts to make the electron volts photons in the pion productions that you <laughs> covered earlier today. And uh, they produce neutrinos and the teratron volts gamma rays. However, uh, we find from um, order of magnitude to numerical estimates that these gamma rays uh, can interact and produce pairs, basically cascade to much lower energies with the same uh, with photons of the same energies that participated in this uh, uh, photopion production. And uh, these uh, original teratron volts gamma rays they may um, uh, down don't scale, don't convert. So they can become mega electron volt gamma rays. And uh, they may, may fall just below or somewhat below the Fermi um, detection range. And that's, uh, that may be a reason why uh, there is no um, gamma ray correlation all the time with neutrinos. Okay, th th this I can understand. But yeah. then the question is, then why do you expect a correlation with radio? So why- with are radio? Wavelengths, you get the correlation with the radio because yeah. in principle they should be completely separated. I mean, yes, yes. Uh, we do not propose uh, that uh, neutrinos and radio wave waves are produced in the same mechanism. Uh, definitely doesn't look like that. But the point is, uh, if um, this simplistic model is uh, roughly correct, then uh, well, uh, radio mostly comes from synchrotron emission of well, presumably electrons. Uh, these electrons produce a uh, higher energy rays in uh, self compton scattering, or likely do that. And uh, these uh, secondary photons uh, can participate in the photopion production. So uh, this is one, one of the reasons why we can expect even temporal correlation between radio and uh, neutrinos, because uh, th this uh, co causal connection is here. And but another reason is, well, so even if this model is not correct, it may well be because this is not observation. This is a, a interpretation of them. Um, then still, no matter what kind of flare happens in the central parsec regions, uh, it uh, often um, it's often uh, uh, manifested as an increase of radio flux uh, in the upcoming month or a year or so. So basically, uh, radio emission is a, a pretty good tracer of uh, any kind of uh, uh, extreme process happening close to the central black hole anyway, even if this process is not directly uh, producing radio waves. Yes, so I, I agree. But still, I think it's, it's I, I, I'm still not understanding fully because as you said, I mean, if you have like a increased flux in radio, this comes from scatter, then this pipe produced, but then you should expect a correlation. They, you should also have GV from SSC or anything. So this is what the, the, the missing part that I'm not, I'm not really understanding. So- Well, uh, definitely we don't understand everything here. Yes, but uh, the missing I mean, whole part can be explained yes. by uh, cascading to lower energy setting. Mm. But it, again, th this is clearly open to other interpretations. This is the, not uh, <laughs> as uh, reliable as uh, observational results themselves. 
Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much for this nice presentation and discussion. So now we move to the next speaker. So next, we, we have monetized this outflow symbiosis to install unified blazer classification, FSRQBLR decomotin. So the speaker is Tushar Mondal. So please uh, share your screen. We see you, but we need that you share the screen also. Am I working? Yes, seems everything is working. So please start, okay. then I notify you when you have two minutes left. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So uh, I will talk about magnetized disk outflow symbiosis to unify blazer classification and FSRQ versus DL-like dichotomy. And this work is done with Professor uh, Mukhopadhyay at ISC. So you can see here the blazer is a particular class of AGM. This schematic diagram is showing a, uh, where supermassive black hole is thickening at the center of the galaxy. And accretion disk is surrounding there. And we see very powerful jet and a lot of other physics like broad line region, narrow line region, we can also see. Now, blazer is a particular source of AGM when this jet is pointing towards us or the beam angle is very small. Now, based on this equivalent width of the optical emission line, so it is further classified into two different subclasses. One is known as flat spectrum radio quasar or FSRQ, where equivalent width is in this zone. And BL-like uh, object, which equivalent width is uh, less than five angstrom, or we don't see any optical emission. Basically, this optical emission is telling that surrounding medium, like broad line region, is present or not there. Depending on that, it is classified. Now the SCD of this blazer spectrum basically showing two broad humps. You can see one is due to the synchrotron peak and other is due to the inverse component of the soft photon. Now the position of the synchrotron peak is basically uh, classified the blazers in three different classes. One is low synchrotron peak or uh, intermediate synchrotron peak and the high synchrotron peak, where the synchrotron peak position is basically given in this joke. So I'll talk about the different classification based on this LSP, ISP, or HSP BLA, or that FSRQ, which is closely linked with this LSP one. Now, if we for that, we took Fermi Blazer catalog data. So based on this Fermi gamma ray photon flux and that energy range where it is operating. So we choose those sources where red shift is measured. Now we can convert that gamma ray luminosity from that gamma ray photon flux, and this is that photon uh, spectral index is plotted for the four different classes, FSRQ, HSP, ISP, and LSP. You can see that FSRQ, this is red one, is that gamma ray observed for, uh, luminosity is very high compared to this HSP BLA. And also the photon index is very high for FSRQ compared to HSP BLA, and ISP and LSP come in between. So there are two differences. The photon index high means there is some accretion signature also there or optical luminosity is there for FSRQ. Whereas HSP be like that signature is absent, completely absent, or we see sometimes narrow emission mode. Now, if we try to correlate this gamma ray luminosity with that accretion disk luminosity, so we try to take this dif uh, different kind of observations based on that, where we can compute that accretion disk luminosity and that intrinsic jet luminosity, and these are nicely correlated. And if we, if we want to compute this intrinsic jet luminosity from this observed luminosity, we can easily model all these blazer classes based on this accretion luminosity. So to get this intrinsic luminosity from this observed one, we have to need the beaming correction because these sources is relativistically beaming and it's towards us. So the beaming angle is very small. So for that, we need beaming correction. Once we have this intrinsic luminosity, we can easily model all these sources based on this accretion, accretion disk model. So to do that beaming correction, we have to understand that which type of uh, beaming model is applicable for these different kind of blazers. So here the schematic diagram is showing that uh, this is jet is pointing towards this and observer is sitting here. So beaming angle is very small. So you can see that uh, rays from that isotropic emission will be Doppler boosted and in the observed frame. And since the beaming angle is very small, the low range factor will be inversely proportional to the beaming angle. And Doppler beaming factor can be computed from this one. 
So once we have that observed luminosity and induced luminosity, it is correlated through this Doppler beam factor. And there are two index. One is for continuous M is depends on the continuous or discrete jet model. And N strongly depends on the which type of cooling factor cooling is uh, operated, like inverse Compton process. There are two mechanisms. One is external component componentization, other is synchrotron self componentization. That means when the plasma has the energetic electron and the soft photon may come from that outside or soft photon may come from the synchrotron soft photon itself. Now it is shown that depending on that uh, cooling mechanism, that soft photon is if it is supplied from outside, then there will be like snow flow effect. That means in that uh, blob frame, that soft photon is moving in that opposite direction and the beaming statistics will be narrower for that external componentization compared to that SSC mechanism. So once we have that SSC and EC processes, and we know the Doppler beam factor, so we can compute that intrinsic luminosity from that observed normal one. So we try to plot here the statistics for all the uh, sources like FSRQ, HSP, ISP, and LSP, BLX. The solid black line is basically telling that the observed normal luminosity. And this dotted line, blue or red, is basically telling that intrinsic luminosity after the beaming correction. So you can notice that for FSRQ, that observed luminosity is three quarter higher compared to that HSP BLX, which is HSP1. But after beaming correction, so you can see that uh, intrinsic luminosity for FSRQ and that HSP BLX comes almost same order. So for that FSRQ, we don't know how much percentage of ex external componentization is happening. So for that, we took two different cases. One is 95% EC, other is 75% EC. So depending on that, uh, it can be shifted in this zone. For HSP BLX, it is totally SSC process because there is no optical emission and photon index is very hard. So external componentization is always negative. <laughs> And ISP and LSP come in between. For LSP BLF, we took 50% SSC, and ISP, we took only SSC mechanism. Now, since we have that intrinsic luminosity after beaming correction, so we can model this uh, intrinsic luminosity for different classes based on this accretion disk model. So before going to that accretion disk model, we have to know a little bit which type of accretion model is applicable in these cases. So there are four different classes of accretion disk model, and depending on the mass accretion there, so this is written in unit of Eddington unit. So Eddington unit is basically telling that the one star can look at maximum where the outward adjacent pressure is balanced in that inward gravity. And one means that accretion date is one Eddington unit. Now we all know the standard uh, disk model and I will compare the other disk model in terms of standard accretion disk model. When the accretion date in this zone, so basically mass density is comparatively high in that disk. So whatever heat will generate through different dissipation mechanism, it will radiate out and the disk become very cool and thin type of disk. So observationally, we see high soft state, that means luminosity high, and soft state means the uh, photon energy, it is basically telling, and it is fitted well by the multicolor disk black body temperature, black body. And if we low down that accretion rate, so that means the matter density will be lower for that accretion model and that ion electron coupling in that model is very low. So whatever heat will generate, it will decide in the ion, it cannot transport to electrons. So radiative mechanism is less significant. So that means whatever heat will generate, it will store as entropy and the disk become hot and puffed up. So this is known as advective type of flow. Observationally, we see low hard state, that means luminosity is low and it is fitted by the power law spectrum. And the power law photon index is very low and varies from 1.4 to 1.8 in this zone. And for in this case, since advection is important, so large scale magnetic field can be advected and powerful jet we can observe in these cases compared to standard disk model. Quiescent state is the lower version of this lower state when uh, that this become very faint and we can get that information of the uh, companion star from this uh, region. When accretion is very high in this state, like slim disk model, when the photon trapping is happening because of the high density. So instead that ion electron coupling is large, also radiation is large, but radiation cannot come out. So again, advection will important. This become hot and puffed up. So this is known as slim disk model. We see very powerful outflow. Here also it is fitted by power law type spectrum, but photon index is very high. Since we are modeling with blazer, so blazer is basically coming in this zone where we see very powerful jet and hard state spectra also. So we want to model in this zone uh, uh, for that accretion date varies in this zone or lower than that. So to do that, uh, we typically go to one typical model for accretion date. So this is nothing but uh, the disk outflow symbiosis, which is coupling between uh, different conservation equations like mass momentum and energy conservation. 
So this is basically telling that continuity equation. This is basically mass radial mass flux and then vertical mass flux is there. Now the momentum balance equation is basically telling that advection parameter and centrifugal is balancing here, and F is that gravity of that black hole, and this is pressure gradient and magnetic field as well effect. One is magnetic pressure gradient, other is the tension like effect, and W is basically telling about the viscous stress mechanism. So we can compare how much is the magnetic stress and viscous stress is operating if the system is threaded by large scale magnetic field. Where the turbulent motion is controlled by the W and large scale magnetic field is controlled by that large scale magnetic field. Since uh, we have taken the simple Newtonian framework here, so this is basically telling the force associated with the simple Newtonian framework of patent square potential. And the energy equation is basically two temperature flow, where the first equation is related to ion and second one is for electrons. So you can see this is basically first law of thermodynamics, where the entropy gradient is written in terms of this. And Q plus is basically a different uh, dissipation mechanism like viscous and magnetic dissipation. Qi is the Coulomb coupling between ion and electron. And this is electron equation, energy equation, where electron will get heat from that ion and it will radiate through different cooling mechanisms. So Q minus basically telling that information of Dave Stanton, synchrotron, and the inverse Compton processes. So this gamma 1, gamma 3 is related to the beta parameter and plasma beta parameter. These are adiabatic indices. Since we are solving the image this uh, equation self-consistently, so we need to take care about no magnetic monopole condition and that induction equation. So when you couple all this uh, formalism, so before going to that, uh, we can couple this equation in terms of this some numerator and denominator, which is basically non-derivative term. And the sonic point is basically telling, since the black hole accretion is transonic nature, that means far away matter is subsonic, and near the black hole it enters with light velocity. So matter has to pass some sonic point. This is known as critical point analysis, where the numerator and denominator will um, vanishes. So this gives one boundary conditions to solve all that self consistently MHD formalism. And magnetic resistance will couple uh, through that alvenic velocity to the sound speed of the medium through this F parameter. F is basically telling that inverse of the magnetic field strength. So when magnetic field strength is very uh, low, that means F is very high. So you can see that alvin velocity is very low, where that radial velocity and sound speed always match. That means Mach number always like uh, transonic nature. As magnetic fields keep increasing, we can see uh, that alpha velocity increases and uh, reach that sound speed of the medium. So after that, we cannot increase the magnetic field strength in the disk. So disk cannot sustain the magnetic field below this zone. So in this way, you can control magnetic field strength in different uh, actors in this model. So here for blazer contribution, so we model both the magnetic field strength and accretion rate to model all these uh, blazer sources. So these are the energetic of the actors in this model, which we try to pull delay from that uh, accretion disk to the jet intrinsic luminosity after beaming correction. So this is basically telling that uh, maximum accretion rate all in that sub uh, sub region where advective disk is applicable. But you can notice that if the circular accretion rate is higher, one order higher compared to that HSP BL lag, because HSP BL lag has no signature of optical emission line and spectral index is very low. Whereas FSI we has some optical emission, so accretion rate should be higher compared to HSP1 and ISP and LSP come in between. So you can notice that even we took that accretion rate one order higher, that luminosity intrinsic luminosity for HSP be like an FSI to come almost in the same order. So to compensate this one order accretion rate, the magnetic field come down that HSP be like has high magnetic field strength near the jet footprint and compared to FSRQ BLAC and ISP and LSP come in between. But for all the cases, the magnetic field strength near that is innermost stable circular orbit will maintain that Eddington magnetic field limit. So Eddington magnetic field limit is basically telling that energy associated with magnetic field, if we correlate with Eddington luminosity, it will uh, correlate with the mass of the black hole in this scale. So interestingly, for HSP and FSR, you can compare that which type of angular momentum transport is happening in the accretion disk. So you can notice that for HSP, we are like that magnetic stress over viscous stress is one order higher compared to that viscous one. That means here large scale magnetic stress is controlling that angular momentum transport and the disk formation. On the other hand, for a FSRQ, you can notice that viscous stress like uh, turbulent viscosity is controlling that accretion disk mechanism. That means angular momentum transport and disk formation is happening. Uh, compared to that large scale magnetic stress. But both the cases, large scale magnetic field is important because it controls not only the jet formation, also that advection is basically telling that magnetic field requirement in that jet footprint, which launches the jet and also stabilizes the jet formation. And ISP and LSP BLA come in between. So if we were, want to model uh, 
wanted to compare that which type of angular momentum transport mechanism is happening. So HSP will like large scale magnetic stress, whereas that uh, FSI will basically magnetic rotational instability, which can control that angular momentum transport. So this is the summary of it. So HSP will like basically telling more optically thin and accuracy in data increases gradually for ISP, LSP, BLX, and finally FSRQ to come in the spectral signature. So the second important parameter is the magnetic field strength apart from accuracy and depth to explain their intrinsic gamma ray luminosity after the dimming correction. So HSP, BLX, that magnetic field strength should be higher compared to that ISP, LSP, and then finally uh, very less for FSRQ, BLX. And for all the cases, it has come down to the magnetic field strength well below that Eddington limit, which is viable for that from, from that observation as well. And the reference of this talk is this one. So thank you. Thank you very much for the nice presentation and to keep the time timing. Please, if there are questions. Uh, I don't see the any hands hands raised. So, uh, just one one question that I wanted to ask myself. So, uh, basically, you you are saying that in the case of FSRQs, you could put some limit on the accretion. Yes. Yes. Sorry. So for FSRQ and HSP BLX, we just both try to control accretion rate and that magnetic field strength. Now accretion rate, we have to in that advective region, not like Keplerian type disk, because we need the jet formation will not happen in the Keplerian disk. Now that accretion rate, we can control for HSP to FSRQ. At the same time, we have to explain that intrinsic luminosity after the beaming correction. So the two, the two parameter here is controlling like magnetic field strength, which can be enhanced that synchrotron cooling mechanism and synchrotron self compromising processes. And at that same time, that accretion rate is basically telling that what is the supply of the soft photon, like external soft photon. So those two cooling mechanism is simultaneously operating and to explain that intrinsic luminosity. So it comes down that accretion rate for FSRQ is very high compared to HSP BLA. To explain that optical emission at the same time if we try to explain that intrinsic luminosity or like that synchrotron uh, peak for hs to like is higher compared to that fsrq so it uh, implies that magnetic field strength should be higher so which enhance that synchrotron and synchrotron self components in process i see thank you very much for your comments so are there any questions so if not, we thank again once more the speaker, then we move to the next speaker. So the next uh, is uh, could the flaring activities observed in Markram 421 and 500 gram be explained in depth of hadron scenarios with two zone emission scenarios and speaker is Edilberto Aguilar Ruiz. So please uh, start to share uh, your screen. Okay. And unmute your microphone. Okay, we can hear you for now, but we don't see your screen yet. Mm. Yes, now it's fine. Yeah. Okay, and let me start yes. the presentation. Okay, can you, okay. Can you watch? Can you watch yes. me the slides? Okay. We, we uh, see your presentation and we can hear you. So you have a 15 minutes. I will notify you when you have two minutes left. Okay. Okay, hello everybody. Um, my name is uh, Edilberto Aguilar from the National University of Mexico and talk about my work in collaboration with Fraihan Sim and Galvan Antonio. The title of this talk is Could the flaring activity observed in Macarian 501 be explained in a leptohadronic scenario with two sun emission? So let me start with a little introduction about blazer. Uh, in general terms, terms, there are two types of blazer. The first is flat spectral radio quasar, which the main feature is that present strong light emission emission with width greater than five Armstrong. Um, the second is Belelac object, which second Belelac object, which don't present this this emission line. In some cases, could be could be weak, weak emission. So here are interest on very like objects. So it's important to mention that this could be subdivided into 
three types depending on the peak of the synchrotron frequency. So the first is low peak belly lag, which frequency peak is below to 10 to 14 hertz. And the second one is intermediate peak belly lag, which frequency is between 10 to 14 hertz and 10 to 15 hertz. Uh, the last is high peak belly lag, which we, for which synchrotron peak is uh, below above uh, 10 to 15 hertz. So in the context of the blazer, the so-called blazer sequence proposed by Fossati and Gisellini. So uh, the, well, the, there are uh, inverse cor correlation between the frequency peak and the lum luminosity of the blazer. Being the high belly lag, uh, the less the less uh, luminous blazer. So, because here we are interested on Macarian five zero one, this is a clear exam example of the so-called extreme high peak belly lag. The, this the main feature of this object is the this synchrotron frequency, which can reach values uh, greater than 10 to 17 hertz. Uh, in this uh, plot, we can see that the peak uh, reach 10 to 17 hertz. Uh, the vertical red line is, the, is corresponding to the HPL. So uh, another interesting uh, uh, feature of Macarian is that are the most nearly blazer uh, together with the Macarian 4, four to 1 located uh, uh, more or less uh, 100 megaparsec. So uh, we're interested on, on explain the, the 2009 May flare, flares. Uh, in this, in that month uh, happens two flares. The first uh, was with significant increase on the very high energy gamma ray gamma ray flux was detected by Veritas, uh, Veritas and first by Whipple. And so this flare uh, do, doesn't have a significant increase in, in the X-ray flux, and 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 was catalogued as a orphan flare uh, because the X-ray was no, no show significant correlation. So the second flare happens 21 days after the fair, first flare, and there are a significant increase in the X-ray flux uh, as, as in the very high energy gamma rays as well. So in order to propose this, Ah, sorry. Uh, uh, bueno, okay. Here we can see the the CDA, C, CED of the first flare. We can watch the increase. We can see the, the increase on the floats on, on very high energy gamma rays. And this flare was associated with variability time scale, scale less than a quarter of hour. Uh, as previously mentioned, this seem uh, as an orphan flare because the increase on X-ray flux is not significant. So the second flare uh, is, is, is less luminous um, compared with the first flare and very high energy gamma ray band. Uh, uh, whereas, in the X-ray flare, uh, shows us a significant increase of the of the flux, but this well, this observation is not uh, in simultaneous was not made simultaneously. But okay, so in order to explain this observation, we propose a two-sum le leptohydronic model. Um, as we, we we can see in the in this picture, this sketch, uh, uh, we propose uh, two emission zones, which follows the standard uh, blob treatment, uh, a spherical homogeneous region. Uh, the, 
here we we have a a, a blob which name which we call as outer blob, which is located uh, far away from the supermassive black hole, and this will be responsible for the the quiescent state from X-ray uh, to GeV gamma rays. So the the key of our proposed model is the assumption of the of the existence of an electron pair plasma that is launched from the central engine, uh, as well as Dorov uh, proposed in 1998, when the when when the accretion when the luminosity of the disk can can increase up to a fraction of the Eddington luminosity, this could launch an electron positron plasma, which emit uh, photons uh, with a spectrum, with a narrow spectrum, uh, uh, say uh, a line shape, picking at 500 uh, key EV, um, and, and is moving with middle relativistic uh, velocity, uh, at least of 0 0.5. So this, the, this plasma is launched, and after the an inner blob is launched too, the, this inner blob will be responsible for the flare state because they contain uh, protons and, and electrons. Here we assume from neutrality condition that electron is just a, a little fraction of the protons in the order of the electron mass and proton mass ratio. So this, so we we analyze the inner blob uh, because they because here uh, happens the proton photon interaction. So uh, the main will be the contribution of photopion production and photopair production as we we see in this plot. Um, the photopion production is only protons in, in a narrow energy range uh, will interact with the photons coming from the pair plasma, producing uh, gamma rays in the order of the tera electron volts. Uh, the secondary parts produced, produced by, by the inner blob will, will radiate uh, via synchrotron radiation. Also, because electron is present there, uh, there we expect a emission at uh, MEV due to the external inverse Compton with the photons coming from the pair plasma. Um, we apply our model to the first first play uh, following the the treatment the treatment of Kellner 2008 and uh, Finke. 2002 for for adronic and leptoadronic uh, and leptonic uh, emission model. So we can observe that the main uh, characteristic of our model is the emission of in high energy band, uh, which can see as orphan flare, and the contribution in the X-ray band is is. It's a small compared with the very high energy flux, so we can we can we can explain with a good uh, fit the first flare. The second uh, we follow the same uh, calculation to to the second flare, so we can observe that also can can be modeled with with a feasible fit where. Uh, we expect the increase in, in radiation in X-ray uh, flux due to the primary electrons uh, via synchrotron radiation from the inner blob, and the increase in the very high energy gamma ray flux is due due to photopion production. So, what is the difference between these two flare basin or model? So in, in the model, we assume the same, the, that the inner blob are moving with the same Boos-Lorentz factor uh, for each, 
for both uh, flares and a size uh, with the same size. With, with so in the first flare, we expect a uh, electroluminosity of the order of 10 to 43 ergs per second. And the second flare are in the same order. But the main difference between electron primary electrons are because in the second flare, we need uh, higher uh, energy electrons and a spectrum with harder, with harder spectrum. Uh, while the proton luminosity is expected to be high in the first flare compared with the second flare, flare and the magnetic luminosity also is expected to be high compared with the second flare. So our conclusion, uh, the flares on May 2009 to be explained on their proposed leptohydronic model with two emission region. The, the equation stays explained with, the, with a standard single dose Compton and external inverse Compton model, model in the outer block. And the very high energy flare, uh, both the one and the two, and the two could be explained by the photopion process in a compact inner flop, uh, which where the size was limited by the variability constraint. Uh, the increase in X-ray flux, flux uh, also could, could be explained by the synchrotron emission of secondary and primary electrons inside the inner blob for the first and the second flare, respectively. Um, and noted that that our model could be testable with future uh, future of X-ray observation at, at 500 and keV due to the pi emission is expected at this energy. So thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. We have a time for questions. So please raise a hand if you have a question. I don't see hands, but could you please show the flare ACD modeling, so these ACDs that you showed? Yes. Um, so this is the first flare and that one is the second, yes? Oh, yeah. right. In the first flare, you also have a difficulty to, 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 to count for this X-ray emission, right? Um, sorry? I mean, in, in this first flare, you have so some X-ray data that are above your model. So, I mean, in any way to have such a hard X-ray emission is, you cannot account this excess that you see in X-ray band, yes? Yes, the, the main contribution of the excess must be expected from the, the secondary pair of the hadronic uh, interaction. That is this, this line. And this could be associated with the increase on on, on X-ray, X increase floods. I see. So Mateo has a question. Please, Mateo, go on. I, a, a quick question. So um, here you fit the SCD, but can you comment on the time scale of the variability you do expect? The variability time scale was restricted. Restrict. Um, to be less than a quarter of hour in the first flare, zero dot twenty five, zero dot twenty five hour. So uh, sorry, you say twenty five hours? No, zero dot a quarter of hour. Okay, so maybe I'm misunderstanding because uh, it should be, I mean, you should get something larger than, right? I mean, your your pion, your pion emission should give you a time scale that it's it's required by the by the proton photon interaction and then in the X-ray by the cascade development. So you should you 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 couldn't be faster than something, right? Uh -huh. Yes. You need yes. time. To, so if you have this value, if not, it's not a problem. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation and the discussion. 
we move to our last speaker of the session. So the last speaker is Gevor Tarjian, which is going to present multivaveling study of high ratio blazars. So uh, Gevor, if you could share your screen, and we see you, uh, share your screen. Yes, we see also the presentation. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, I'll notify Gevor. when you have uh, two minutes left. OK. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Gevor Karachinian from Granite, Armenia. Uh, the title of my presentation is uh, multi wavelength study of uh, uh, high energy brothers uh, uh, and Carter uh, David Israelian. And uh, uh, as an introduction uh, for blazars, uh, in the unification scheme of radioactive galactic nuclei, uh, blazars are a subclass with a relativistic jet making a small angle with the observer's uh, line of sight. Uh, blazars are characterized with high polarization, short and strong variation, both in time and amplitude. And uh, blazars uh, are usually grouped into large classes, FSLQs and BLX, based on the absence or presence of emissions uh, in uh, their optical spectrum. Uh, the sample which has been chosen to uh, study consists of 33 sources from uh, which two are BLX objects, five uh, are Blazar candidate uh, sources with uncertain type, and 26 are FSLQs. Uh, why especially uh, Blazars which are achieved higher than uh, 2.5? Uh, firstly, because uh, study of these sources can shed light on cosmological evolution of blazars and supermassive black holes. Also, evolution of relativistic jets across different cosmic epochs uh, can be investigated. A limit on the density of extragalactic background light can be derived, and it is worth to mention studying attraction disk jet connection and uh, to investigate environments around supermassive and black holes. Uh, for the current study, uh, we used uh, two telescopes, Fermi, Lat, and Swift. And telescopes for the lots of uh, downloaded data uh, between 2008 uh, to 2018 and uh, performed analysis to uh, obtain uh, spectral and temporal parameters for uh, considered sources. And the considered sources of these ones uh, were observed by uh, Swift Telescope during 15 years. Uh, uh, for the X ray XF analysis, we uh, have been applied a standard. Procedure uh, source region is a circle with 20 pixel radius. Background is an analog region with 51 and 85 pixels, uh, inner and outer ready. Fittings work was performed with expect tool. For swift what analysis, source, uh, source region is a circle with uh, five half second radius. Background is a circle with 20 half second radius, and uh, uh, magnitude was converted. Uh, counts was converted to magnitude, and magnitude was converted to Classes. Uh, analysis results uh, in this uh, plane we uh, see photon index, gamma ray photon index versus gamma ray uh, photon flux. Uh, and uh, photon index is between 1.71 to 3.05. And flux is estimated to be in uh, 4.84, uh, 10 and power minus 10, and uh, to uh, 1.5, 10 and power minus uh, 7. Uh, two BLAC objects uh, uh, has the uh, lowest luminosity, uh, flux, gamma, gamma ray fluxes, and the uh, highest gamma ray flux has the three, uh, 1343. And in this plane, we show gamma ray photon index versus uh, gamma, ray photon, uh, gamma ray luminosities. And uh, as in this plane, in this plane, two B31343 is the most luminous object, and luminosity is between 1.0. 1 10 and power uh, 47 to 5.54 4, 10 and power uh, 48. Uh, X ray photon index uh, versus X ray photon flux uh, was shown here. Uh, in this plane, the highest uh, O222 uh, has the uh, most uh, flux, uh, for X ray flux, and the X ray photon index is between 1.01 to 2.33. And flux is between 5 10 and power uh, 14 minus 14 and power minus 11. Uh, to investigate gamma ray variabilities of uh, considered sources, uh, have been used uh, a powerful method, uh, adaptive binning method. Uh, uh, in this method, uh, during uh, <coughs> quiescent state, uh, time periods are longer than uh, during flaring states, and it allows us to uh, search and find. Uh, flaring periods. Uh, for example, 
Uh, in uh, this frame, we see several separating fields in other TV ambient uh, light curve. Uh, and uh, B3, uh, for B343, twice in twice in state, the gamma ray flux is uh, 1, 2, 5, 10, and power to minus 8. And on MGD, uh, 55, uh, 891.7 was over the maximum gamma ray flux, which is 1, uh, uh, 8.77. Uh, 10 and power minus seven. And uh, for this uh, flux corresponds uh, luminosity 1.5, uh, 10 and power uh, 50 f per second. Uh, but average uh, luminosity of this source uh, was uh, 10 uh, to four, so 10 and power 48 f per second. And uh, for this source, which has been in flaring state, is the gas of 537. Uh, in and the average gamma ray flux of the source was 4.48 10 and power minus 8. And in on MGD, 57.879.2 was over the highest gamma ray flux, uh, which is uh, 6.58 10 and power minus 7. Uh, and the corresponding luminosity is 4 for 10 and power 48 per second. Uh, also, uh, other, uh, for other sources, uh, variable, uh, gamma ray flux variability are investigated. For these sources, flux variabilities were uh, from week to month scales. Uh, the most distant flaring blazars is uh, MG3, J16, uh, um, which redshift is uh, 3.65. And the average peak value of gamma ray flux of this source was uh, 6.4 10 power minus uh, 7. In addition, uh, gamma ray flux variability, also gamma ray photo index vari variabilities uh, were investigated. Uh, the hardest photo index uh, of uh, B3 uh, 1343 was ob observed on MGD 58089, uh, uh, and the value of photo index was uh, 1.73. Uh, for uh, PKS uh, of 451, uh, uh, our observed uh, two periods when uh, photon index uh, is uh, 2.06 uh, and uh, 2.17. Uh, uh, in this MGDs, respectively, uh, the gamma ray spectrum of the free of 908 average over 10 years was uh, 2.42. Uh, uh, meanwhile, on MGD uh, 57 was uh, 517. The photon index changed to 1.84. Uh, uh, the seven day uh, bin light curve of THS uh, uh, 907 shows that there are uh, three periods when uh, its gamma ray emission appears with unusual hard gamma ray spectrum and uh, values uh, are shown respectively. Uh, for uh, theoretical modeling uh, have been used one zone tonic model. The emission region is assumed to be a spherical blob of radius of R and it is located outside of broad line region. The uh, emitting region is filled with a uniformly tangled magnetic field and the uh, uh, emission region contains homogeneous population of relativistic electrons. The low energy component of uh, blazars uh, in this sample uh, uh, is due to synchrotron emission of relativistic electrons, and the high energy component is due to uh, inverse Compton scattering. Uh, scattering in this sample uh, as a target uh, photon field for inverse Compton scattering uh, was chosen uh, in infrared, infrared photons from dusty holes. <coughs> And the said modeling results of uh, bright sources are uh, presented here. In gray, we see uh, archival data uh, with cyan, red, and uh, blue uh, shown optical UV, X ray, and gamma ray data, uh, respectively. Different components were uh, fitted, uh, and uh, for example, uh, thermal emission from the dusty torus and accretion disk uh, fitted and uh, uh, presented with. Uh, red and uh, blue dot dashed lines, respectively. Uh, SSA component which uh, reaches uh, to X-ray, uh, up to X-ray, uh, plotted with uh, dotted lines, and uh, uh, high energy uh, component fitted, shown here. With magenta uh, are shown uh, hardening of spectra, which uh, means that uh, spectrum uh, ex extended to uh, high energies. 
for different uh, <coughs> set of other sources uh, also were modeled uh, and the results are uh, shown in this table for uh, you can see uh, as a uh, summary we can say that except for two uh, uh, for the two blx of the gamma ray photon index of all the considered uh, rsg blazars uh, range from 2.18 to 3.05 the swift X-ray observation shows significant X-ray emission only from the FSRQs considered here. And the X-ray flux is spanning from 5 to 10 power minus 14 to 10 power minus 11. The gamma ray variability of considered uh, sources has shown uh, shortened long time scales variabilities from sub day uh, to month scales. Uh, the set were modeled within a one zone leptonic scenario and uh, as a photon field uh, considered uh, both uh, synchrotron photons and infrared photons from the dusty torus. Uh, for, uh, for the radius of the emitting region, it, it is uh, estimated that the uh, value is lower than 0.05 uh, parsec, while the magnetic field and the Doppler factor are correspondingly within uh, all 0.10 to 1.74 Gauss. And for Doppler factor, the value is between 10 uh, to 27 to uh, 0.42. And the black hole uh, masses are estimated to be within 1.69 to 5.35 10 and power 9 solar masses. The jet luminosity is estimated to be lower than 1.41 10 and power 46 hectare per second. And uh, the jet luminosity is lower uh, than the disk uh, luminosity, which is uh, in this range 1.09 uh, to 10.94, uh, uh, 10 power 46 uh, earth per second. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Georg. So, we get this presentation uh, about the high gratitude blazers. So, if there are any questions, please raise a hand. Uh, I don't see any hand raised, so it means that everything was clear. So thank you very much. Uh, okay, well, I, I think this was the last presentation of the session. I think we had a very interesting session, so discussing many different properties of Blazas. I would like to thank all the speakers of the session and also the participants of the session. So thanks, and I hope to see you all in the other sessions as well. So the Marcel Grossman meeting is still. Uh, Matteo, you have a question? No, I'm clapping, sorry. Oh, I see. Okay, yes. So I'm virtually clapping too. So thank you for joining the meeting and thank you for all, everyone for these nice presentations. The meeting is still continuing. There are some very exciting sessions today also. And there is a public lecture that is quite good overlapping with this uh, parallel session. So this will be about neutrinos presented by Francis Halsen. So it will be quite interesting. So I invite everyone to join this parallel as this public lecture as well. So once more, thank you very much, everyone. Hope to see you soon and well, to see you in other sessions as well. So bye and thanks for joining to the meeting and presenting the, your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.